Testing one, two. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is two o'clock and we want to go ahead and begin by announcing that uh, this is our County of Santa Clara Health and Hospital Committee meeting uh, live and in person, I believe for the first time in close to three years. So when I say it's nice to see you all, I really do mean it's nice to see you all. And uh, we will begin with item number one, which is the call to order. Let me ask our clerk uh, if she would please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Good afternoon, present. Chairperson Smidian. Present as well. Thank you very much. We have both members of the committee present and accounted for. We have, uh, before we get to item number two, which is public comment, and we will get there in just a moment, uh, I want to uh, ask both uh, County Council's office if they're available and also the clerk of the board for a little guidance uh, and perhaps some uh, changes in the future in terms of items that are sometimes colloquially referred to as Levine Act items, which are noticed on page one of our four-page agenda, also uh, sometimes referred to as Government Code Section 84308, 
also sometimes referred to as Senate Bill 1439. And um, just a, a pair of requests for the clerk's office, uh, not for action today, obviously, is um, we had uh, talked at a prior meeting, actually of our full board earlier this month, about taking the Levine Act language and pumping it up to a regular font size rather than having the sort of smaller font size and making it a standalone page so that it was easier to uh, read and would stand out a little bit more uh, to help ensure compliance. And then uh, similarly, where uh, there is one item uh, today, Supervisor uh, Lee and Clerk, uh, that is triple asterisked on page three of four. And um, I, I know that that's an effort to help us by giving us a heads up and the public that that's a, uh, a, an action item requested uh, that is uh, also subject to the Levine Act, also known as SB 1349, also known as Government Code Section 84308. Uh, but if we could find a way to make that a little bit more prominent, it may be as simple as pumping up the font size again uh, and um, uh, and or putting a reference there to, you know, C page whatever or C Levine Act info or subject to the Levine Act. But let's try and find a way to make sure that you don't have to know the secret code uh, in order to know what that is. Thank, but, and thank you very much. This is a, uh, a good start and we're gonna need a little bit more. Now, with respect to county council's office on this item, who do we have representing council today? I'm Michaela Lewis, supervisor. One more time, please. Michaela Lewis. Ms. Lewis. And is that Ms. Hansen seated next to you? Ms. Hansen, which of your many roles are you playing today, if I may ask? <laughs> Chief Operating Officer. Chief Operating Officer, okay. She's not even part of the alumni club, apparently, so. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, let me uh, ask uh, the County Council's office uh, for your thoughts on how we might handle item A4 or 4A, forgive me. And the reason I am asking Supervisor Lee before we get to public comment or any of our action items is um, I have indicated that given the level of uh, uncertainty, ambiguity about the operation of uh, government code section 84308, Senate Bill 1439, it would be my intention to recuse myself from action on that item to ensure compliance uh, I, you know, I'm definitely not shooting the messenger here uh, for County Council's office. I know we're all doing the best we can to uh, scramble a little bit and deal with um, state legislation that has yet to be clarified. Dr. Smith, I see you leaning in. Do you want to cut in front of our lawyer? Is that okay? You can. You're the. Yeah, I'm going to cut in front of her. I'm sorry, Michaela. It's a. Uh, it's really a policy perspective, and I think our recommendation is that uh, we hear that item at the full board instead of at the subcommittee. So um, from an administrative perspective, we'll just put that off so that none, either of the board members has to indulge in voting or making a decision about what to do because certainly we would not have a quorum to make a decision. Thank you for so that. So we're just gonna pull it off and put it on the regular agenda of the board. All right, I will refrain from any discussion of the subject matter since that's the whole point of a recusal. Yep. I will ask as a process matter, Ms. Lewis, um, I wanna just articulate for you uh, some of the challenges here uh, and um, Supervisor Lee, still keeping my remarks limited to uh, the challenges of uh, ensuring compliance with Government Code Section 84308, the Levine Act, Senate Bill 1439. Ms. Lewis, I think you know that my office and my entire staff had a presentation for two hours by two attorneys from the County Council's office. We found that very helpful. Uh, that being said, um, understandably, the answer to a lot of our questions was that's still not clear. 
Uh, and so let me just play that out for you and your colleagues on this item. And for those of you who wonder what on earth is it is that we're talking about over here, it will quickly become clear, or at least the lack of clarity will quickly become clear. So here we go. On item 4A, for example, by my count, there are more than 90 individuals who are subject to various uh, approvals, um, entitlements, uh, licenses, authorizations that are being requested today. The reason that uh, gave me pause is because, as you know, pursuant to the legislation, which I've mentioned now a couple of times, th there is a prohibition on board members taking any action on such items if we have received a contribution in excess of $250 from an interested party who has a financial interest uh, during the prior year. In our instance, it's effective January 1st, so it's only the last couple of weeks, but also a prohibition on our receiving a contribution for 12 months subsequent to the action. Um, and uh, not just again, retrospectively, looking back 12 months, but also during the time when uh, an item was pending. Uh, and we don't really have clear definitions on something like this. When was it pending? Was it pending the day the agenda was published? Was it pending the day somebody submitted a request to be so authorized or... Um, appointed or reappointed or granted a privilege. So when was it pending? Not for today, but for future sorting out. Um, who is a party with a financial interest? Is it just the 90 plus folks who are there? Let me pause for a moment, because if it were the 90 plus folks who were there and just them, over the course of 12 months, that's something like a thousand of these folks that we have to then keep track of and be able to look retrospectively 12 months behind us and be mindful 12 months going forward to avoid a problem times a thousand times X number of contributions that any individual board member might have. So when is it pending? And who is a party, which is not indicated on our agenda, that's something we've talked with council about. Um, and some quick and obvious questions to me. So for example, is a spouse um, an interested party? Do they have a financial interest? Um, and if so, how are we to know that? How are we to know that somebody is a spouse given the fact that spouses often have different last names from one another? Um, and uh, I think that's just a couple of examples of the kind of things that we need to know, which is what's pending, who's a party, uh, how are we to know who has a financial interest as defined by um, state law and applicable regulations and opinions in the matter. So with that understanding, um, we uh, look forward to greater clarity as it becomes available, and uh, that will take us uh, Supervisor Lee, unless you want to weigh in on that subject at all, uh, we'll just m move to public comment. But uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for the heads up, and I'm sure the clerk will note it again. Public comment is item number two. Before we get there, I do have one more question for the clerk, if I may, which is uh, we are moving back in person again, and uh, we will offer the opportunity for public comment. Are we able to accommodate public comment from folks who are listening remotely? We are not currently able to do that at the committee level. All right. And uh, we had some conversation about this issue at the full board as well. And I know that at least a couple of members of the Board of Supervisors, myself included, are uh, hoping we can find a way to allow what I'll call the fullest level of participation possible uh, in a hybrid format at our committee meetings. The clerk's office has given us some indication that that might be possible if additional resources were available. We'll give it a look. Uh, and then that means that we're gonna hear from folks who are here today who have asked to speak under public comment, which is that portion of our agenda set aside for comment by members of the public on non-agendized items properly within the jurisdiction of this committee. Madam Clerk, how many do we have? I have one request for item two. 
Thank you. If you would bring that to me, I will call that person. I think you're used to doing this when we do it remotely, so I'm going to call Paul Soto. Uh, and Mr. Soto, because we have only one speaker on this item, uh, we can accommodate up to three minutes in remarks. Welcome. Please begin. Thank you. Forgive uh, me. Thank you, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, I want to thank you at least for the attempt at uh, clarifying that previous issue that you were addressing. Um, I think there's ethical questions rather than just legal ones that need to be sorted out. Um, so I just want to th uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Sarah Cody is here because there was a comment that you had made and you said it very, very publicly and very, very uh, with conviction. And you stated that racism is a public health issue. This is what you said. I'm still waiting for the memo on that. I'm waiting for the policy on that. I want to know what you meant by that. I want to know exactly the, the systematic way in which my health has been impacted because of racist policies in this county. I'm still waiting, and I expect it. And the reason why I do is because I'm not going to allow anybody in this county to stand there and politicize what has happened to my people. I am a representation of an entire community th whose lives have been impacted by racist policies since July 14th of 1846 when Thomas Fallon planted that flag in the city. This was founded in 1850. Peter Burnett was still the governor of California in 1851. He stated explicitly, and I quote, that the war of extermination against the native Indian is to be expected. Although it is with great regret, it is beyond the wisdom or will of man to avert, end quote. January 7th of 1851, given here in this city. The flags out there are from 1850. So that means that quote was given in this county while it was the county of Santa Clara. This is the history of racism that needs to be accounted for within the context of health and health care. Because until we get to a point where we're going to have an extremely uncomfortable conversation, very, very, it's going to make people uncomfortable. That's fine. How uncomfortable has it been living with racist policies? Policies that, that, uh, that uh, the county executive referenced yesterday that the lack of housing due to the redlining policies that have occurred here have created all of these systems that you referenced when you said that public health and racism is a public health issue. So there's, it's very clear and easy for me to tie them in because I have had to live generationally with the impacts of the neglect of having that conversation. It's not gonna happen anymore, not gonna happen. So I encourage, uh, I'm gonna be waiting for that memo to hear your position on how racism is a public health issue. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let me turn to the clerk, confirm that we have no other speakers on item number two. That's correct. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, and that takes us then to item number three, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes to the committee's agenda, if any. We have already uh, indicated that there were some comments and questions that I uh, uh, placed between items one and two, just so we could get clarity about how to proceed. I should also have indicated at that time, uh, Supervisor Lee, that I know we have a hard stop at 4.30. So for those of you who are uh, watching our time management today, 4.30 uh, is the uh, time certain. And uh, then that will take us to the consent calendar. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar and the agenda? Uh, as amended with the deletion of item 4A, with the understanding that item 4A will now go to the full board per Dr. Smith's request. And I see County Council leaning in. Did we cover everything there? We're all good. I got the official thumbs up. Thank you. So moved. All right. Motion by Lee, second by Simidian. Uh, we do have one card from a uh, speaker, and that's uh, Mr. Paul Soto again. Mr. Soto, the only thing I would ask is um, we do ask now on a consent calendar that if you have remarks to share, we're happy to hear them, but they do need, uh, pursuant to our rules in the State Brown Act, to be directed towards the consent calendar items, which are 12, 13, 14, and 15. 
Excuse me, super, uh, one moment please, Mr. Soto. Dr. Smith. Um, it should be for A, B, and C because B and C also involve privileges. Okay, let's uh, take a moment. Just to clarify, I think it's just A, the, the, um, the, the list of, of folks who are coming up for privileges. But My understanding, Dr. Smith, is that if you look at our agenda that, and I'm perfectly happy to handle this any way that the team likes uh, as long as we recuse ourselves properly. But my understanding was that B and C did not involve specific appointments, reappointments, or privileges, and therefore, pursuant to the judgment of county council, we could take action on those without invoking uh, the provisions of the government code that I referenced. But let me turn to county council and get the direction again. Yes, that's correct. Dr. Smith. I won't argue with County Council. I was just making the point that this defines what kind of privileges are available. Okay. Um, to be continued, and uh, every one of these conversations, as painful as they are, is, in my view, a helpful conversation because it allows us to uh, further clarify where we need guidance in the future. So if we could ask the County Council's office to take a look at the interplay that Dr. Smith has pointed out between B and C in the item 4A, which will be removed for the consent calendar pursuant to the motion from Supervisor Lee, which I have seconded. Ms. Lewis, does that work for you? That's fine. Great, thanks so much. Mr. Soto, back to you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I wanted to talk about that specifically, the 4A, because any time that, that the, under the consent calendar, if the agenda is amended, those items are allowed to be referenced in this context. And so 4A, we're not looking as, as, as citizens in our community, we're not looking for people to follow the law. That's expected. That's just, that's a no brainer. We expect of our politicians and we expect of anybody that has access to a politician to exercise ethics as well. I think ethics is an important thing. I think principles are important. Now, I may be an idiot in that assessment, but nonetheless, I have those values, ethics and principles. And I think that those are missing because we keep talking about what was legal. What was legal? Well, redlining was legal. Redlining was legal. It was legal for $5 per head and 25 cents per scalp bounty hunting of Native Americans and Mexicans. Those things were legal. So I'm not concerned about the law. I'm concerned about the ethics and principles that govern our counties and our cities. And if we're going to be splitting hairs on, ethic, on, on, on the legal questions, that means the moral and the ethical question never gets answered, never. Because it gets lost in that morass of trying to defend what it is that I know for a fact is indefensible, and we're gonna hide behind the law to do it. Thank you. All right, I believe that concludes, Madam Clerk, all of our speakers on that item. Please call the roll on item three, which is to approve the consent calendar and the changes to our committee's agenda. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Passes unanimously. That takes us to items four, B and C, and uh, we welcome you uh, through all of that. And if you would like to uh, present, let us uh, please introduce yourself just for the record, even though we know who you are, and doctor, and uh, uh, make your request. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian and Supervisor Lee. I'm Dr. Harry Morrison. I'm the president of the enterprise medical staff of Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. And I'm presenting items uh, 4B and 4C. Thank you very much. Answer any questions. Um, I have no questions. Supervisor Lee, are you prepared to move uh, approval of the recommended actions on 4B and C? Yes, I am. I do actually have a question first, if, uh, if I might. Um, of course. So uh, the core privileges uh, listed in the nurse practitioner NP pr uh, contract um, includes uh, ACLS and PLS. So are procedures like intubation, uh, chest tube, uh, parasynthesis are included on these? 
So let me describe how the privilege sets mm -hmm. are, are developed. Um, these, uh, this privilege set for the uh, uh, nurse practitioners and, and emergency department uh, were developed with input from the emergency department physician leadership as well as advanced practice providers. The committee that um, revises and uh, updates the privilege sets is composed of physicians and advanced practice providers. Almost 50% of the committee membership is advanced practice providers. Uh, the privileges that were not included were ones that were not requested uh, by uh, the um, physician leaders in those departments, and also they were not um, current privileges of uh, the uh, nurse practitioners in, those in that department at this time. Um, the privilege sets are reviewed periodically and, and revised as needed. And if uh, the physician leaders um, request um, uh, an additional privilege, or if in our committee discussions that this uh, comes up um, amongst the uh, members of the committee that, the, that we consider the additional privilege, of course the committee would review that and um, uh, make a recommendation to the Enterprise Medical Executive Committee in that regard. So, so going back, my question is: uh, um, so, as far as you know, are those procedures I mentioned, intubation, chest tube, and paracentesis, are those included in the NP contract or no? I do not believe that they are. No. They're not. Okay. Right. So the reason why this came up is not really me, because I frankly don't really know too much of this. But that we've been approached by our NPA, our nursing uh, 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 labor group, uh, about these issues, and asked uh, that this is something to be discussed. So I'm not sure it has been discussed with them. So for that reason, I would actually ask to see if you might be able to go back and, and at least have a discussion with them before coming back to us to, for the approval, if that's okay. So for today, if that's not included, I would be ready to move on uh, approving item number C for now and ask for B to, to come back to us. If this discussion can take place and we can come back uh, next meeting. Well, that's uh, my motion. Uh, uh, Supervisor Lee, yes. if you don't mind if I comment? Sure, please. That? Okay. The Enterprise Medical Staff is independent of the County of Santa Clara. Uh, the mission of the Enterprise Medical Staff is upholding and improving the quality of care mm -hmm. and patient safety. Uh, collective bargaining units composed of Santa Clara County workers have a relationship with the employer, which of course is the County of Santa Clara. The Enterprise Medical Staff does not have a relationship with any bargaining collective bargaining unit. So yeah, I understand that. I think it will be helpful actually to to <clears throat> to get them involved because of the fact it's not so much as bargaining unit, but the fact that there certainly is a voice of those who are doing the work. Uh, the nurse practitioner, I believe, are represented by them, and those are the ones that privileges are being affected. And based on that reason, I think there is a voice that needs to be discussed, and I certainly want to make sure that's been engaged because by the time they come and talk to us, that means there's an issue. Again, I'm, I don't want to get involved with the issues, but let's say if after the discussion you said, you know what, this is absolutely something that we cannot approve, bring it back to us and explain to us why, and I think that will be good. But at this time, I don't think we're ready for it. Um, is there any urgency, actually, to approve that today, or can we wait for another month on the nurse practitioner's uh, privilege at this point? You don't mind, uh, Supervisor Lee? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, privilege sets are uh, needed. The updated privilege sets are needed. I, I can't say um, how urgent, but uh, I can let you know that uh, they've gone through many rounds of revision and mm -hmm. um, uh, they're, uh, that the uh, departments are waiting for these privilege sets to be completed. Right, right. But the thing is, if you do not approve it today and we have to wait till next month to approve it, this is not going to stop operations. Am I correct? No. Okay. All right. So I will save my motion. Move to approve basically item 4C and for 4B to be uh, continued until next month. I'm going to try and mediate this. I may be successful. I may not. We'll see how it goes. Supervisor Lee, mm -hmm. yes. any chance you'd be willing to include 4B as well as 4C while indicating to Dr. Morrison and his team that you would not be prepared to take a subsequent step at our next meeting until and unless the outstanding issues that you've raised were resolved to your satisfaction? Okay, so you're saying reserving this issue to be re, re discussed if, uh, if Dr. Morrison, did you understand what I was trying to accomplish there? 
That was my fancy way of saying, how about we take action on 4B and 4C today, and you two go sort this out between now and the next meeting. I agree. And, yeah. and will we report back on this issue? And, and we'll get an off-agenda report back. Dr. Smith, does that sound like a plausible solution to you? I'm hoping people will take yes for an answer today. I um, think that's a plausible solution. I just wanted to add a couple of two cents. Please. Um, as with all public comments and decisions, um, we always like people to intervene in the process at the appropriate spot. And since this is an action of the medical staff, the appropriate time for the union to intervene through its members is during the medical staff discussions, not at the political level. However, since they have expressed their concern, there's nothing to prevent them from talking with, uh, obviously, the elected officials. Um, but they do have the opportunity to provide, provide input and um, discussion during the medical staff meeting as part of their bylaws because they're members of the medical staff. So and that was a long way of saying yes, but trying to explain the process. Got it. And Dr. Morrison, I think what you've heard from Supervisor Lee, not to put words in his mouth, is he's prepared to move forward on 4B and C today, but the issue is one that he would like to see resolved between now and our next meeting, and he may not be willing to move forward on that item at our next meeting. Uh, Supervisor Lee, did I capture that Fair enough. Yes. correctly? Okay. Thank you. I just want to clarify that um, nurse practitioners are not members of the medical staff. And I think, I think Supervisor Lee said earlier he gets that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Right. Okay. Welcome to our first in-person meeting of the Health and Hospital <laughs> Committee, Doctor. All right. Uh, I'm going to second the amended motion. Madam Clerk, you're clear that the motion is on 4B and 4C with some uh, requested clarification and communication between now and our next meeting, yes? Yes. Thank you for that. Let's call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee? Aye. Chairperson Simidian? Aye. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you. Take care. All right. That item has never been this interesting in the 10 years that I've been on this committee, so there you go. Item number five, which is to receive the report from Santa Clara uh, Healthcare relating to the hospital integration and performance of the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, O'Connor, and St. Louis. And uh, who's going to present on this item? Thank you, Chair Simidian, Paul Lorenz, Chief Executive Officer for Santa Clara Valley Healthcare, uh, Supervisor Lee. It is uh, my pleasure to actually have this time with you to give you an update on the integration of the two hospitals into the health system. As you recall, back in March of 2019, your board authorized the acquisition of the two hospitals to, to integrate into the uh, healthcare system. Uh, as you well know, shortly thereafter, uh, this county uh, and all the healthcare systems within the county of Santa Clara was confronted along with the public health department in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, even through the pandemic, and as outlined in our report, your healthcare system continues to grow and provide access to care, um, unprecedented in terms of what we see in other counties and other health jurisdictions throughout the state. And when I speak of unprecedented, I'm uh, around access to care. Um, while we in Santa Clara County continue to grow as a system and provide additional points of access for our community and our residents, other jurisdictions within the state of California continue to struggle. If, if not, um, you see closures of community hospitals and other community assets around healthcare. In the report, uh, we give very specific numbers in terms of our uh, growth as a system. And I just want to share a couple of these numbers with you. Uh, both O'Connor Hospital and St. Louis Hospital, in terms of the hospital uh, patient days and daily census, uh, have grown. Um, at O'Connor Hospital, we've seen a 
percent increase in our patient days and patient volumes. Uh, and at St. Louis Hospital, 93%. And to put numbers to that, uh, at the time of acquisition, St. Louis Hospital is running a census of between 20 and 25. Uh, today, we, it is not unheard of for our census to reach 64 patients on a, any given day. At O'Connor Hospital, uh, their census was running under 100 on some days, and uh, in some situations, we had seen the census around 80. Today, uh, we see volumes and patient census reach in the neighborhood of 220, 215 to 220 patients per day. Not only have we seen the growth in those two hospitals, uh, but overall as a health system, uh, along with Valley Medical Center, uh, Collectively, it represents close to a 20% increase in patient volume in terms of patient days. Um, the other important note, uh, as you well recall, um, in the South County, we were, as a county, deeply concerned about emergency room access to that region. Uh, at the time of acquisition, uh, they were seeing about 30,000 patients in their emergency department uh, today they're seeing over 40,000 patients on an annual basis. Uh, that represents a 25% increase. Um, uh, to give you some sense of the importance of that hospital to the community and the, the success of integration, the, uh, the, the emergency department on some days were around 90, 80 to 90 patients per day. Um, we had seen during the course of the past three years, census reached up to about 180. And that emergency department bed capacity, just to give some perspective, they have eight licensed ED beds. And so, of course, during the course of this time, we've found ways to increase their capacity to, to better serve the community and ensure that they've had access to care. Uh, other areas which you see growth in the system um, not just at the two hospitals, but overall, our surgical volumes have also increased. Um, and uh, the, probably the most important uh, message to convey uh, to the community and, and to this committee is that our ability to expand services, outpatient services, from bariatric services to cardiology, to urology, has further benefited, benefited from the, the acquisition of the two hospitals um, and allowed us to provide the additional capacity. But even yet today, we are challenged in, in ensuring that uh, we can provide timely access to critical outpatient specialty services. So today, what we are focused on as a system um, are a number of areas, and I think you will have an appreciation for this. Uh, our ability to provide services in your system is dependent on our ability to retain our workforce. So our focus has been around workforce recruitment and retention, and as previous discussions in board meetings and committee meetings uh, around wellness uh, to ensure that we have a healthy, strong, uh, workforce uh, as we continue to deal with the growing demand on your system. The other uh, areas in which we as a system are focused on uh, is integration of service lines. Um, as a healthcare system uh, that is now regional in terms of our service capabilities, uh, we are looking at making sure that we create centers of excellence so we leverage our expertise and resources to the full extent possible. Uh, some areas uh, of note, um, and as you will see in our report, um, as an example, is uh, our oncology services. Um, so everything from radiation oncology to medical oncology, we infusion. We as a system have uh, now integrated across the three hospitals to ensure one standard of care and to ensure that we're leveraging our resources. Uh, that has allowed for increased capacity, which is exactly what this board um, 
was intending on when they acquired the two hospitals. So overall, that's just one example, but overall, I, I think uh, as we come out of the COVID situation uh, during this integration period, which represented three of the four years, I think you will continue to see significant improvement in terms of our ability to provide access through uh, increased capacity uh, and improvements around operational efficiencies. Uh, the other area which I think your board, uh, this committee, has particularly paid close attention to is our finances. Um, and as you would note in the report, um, uh, that between two operating years, four operating years in 2021, then to 2122, uh, you see uh, an improvement in our financial position. Um, there's a lot of factors that play into that, everything from prior year funding to uh, reimbursement for COVID-related expenditures, uh, which were quite significant during this period of time. But overall, with these challenges, I think you continue to see the system perform relative to service as well as financially. Uh, with that being said, uh, I I'm, I'm, would be happy to take any specific questions that you have about our report or our progress. Excuse my multitasking, Ms. Torrens, I apologize. I'm gonna to turn to Supervisor Lee first. Um, thank you very much uh, for the, the report uh, on this item. Um, first of all, when I hear that there's a significant increase on average daily census and patient days, especially uh, those in uh, O'Connor being over 68%, St. Louis being 93%, I read it as good news that more patients are choosing and are being served by our, um, our hospitals, uh, and that, that probably will be a better efficiency of scale. So that, to me, seems to be a good news, Paul. Um, so do you agree? And then two is, um, how exactly have you, uh, what have you done to accommodate these large increases? Thank you, Supervisor mm -hmm. Lee. So a, a couple points. Uh, one, you're right that more individuals are now uh, depending on our, our system for care. And that we are proud of because we do believe we provide high quality care um, and we're here to serve the community. In general, I can tell you that not only is your healthcare system challenged, but other healthcare systems throughout the county and throughout the state. Uh, volumes have increased for a number of different reasons. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I would say because uh, during the COVID situation, a lot of people deferred their health care mm -hmm. and are now returning to the system for that care. So you have a bolus of patients that were challenged with from a health care perspective. Your public system, though, if you look at the numbers, um, we're growing not just related to the COVID deferment of care. We're growing because there is a greater need in the community for uh, our safety net system. Uh, so you see a growth in the number of uh, individuals that qualify for government-sponsored programs, ranging from Medi-Cal to Medicare to Covered California. And then, of course, we have our own coverage programs locally to ensure access to care. Um, so I, I think given the economy and the way things are heading, uh, there is a, a greater reliance on your safety net system. Mm -hmm. And do you believe this is uh, also... Um a function of the fact that more people in our county is now covered by some health care coverage. Therefore, they are able to utilize our system for it as well, and that's what all part of the increase. Yes, and, and, and Supervisor Lee, you, you know, you're referring to something that we all know, which is if you have the means to access care, mm -hmm. uh, there's a greater likelihood that you would use that. Uh, so individuals that do have Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. covered California, et cetera, are going to utilize the system. Great. Um, on the report titled uh, Financial Compared to Actual, the report states that a key focus in the immediate future is to increase efficiency across the three hospitals. Um, and this says that one of the key focus is, quote, increase efficiencies as it relates to financial performance of the three hospitals, unquote. So uh, would you like to explain uh, how this is being accomplished? Um, so in, in a number of areas as a system um, uh, that you would typically see in terms of improvement financially, one is your, your, your revenue cycle. Um, and 
but no Sharma can speak to what we're doing around revenue cycle improvement initiatives uh, to improve our metrics ranging from our accounts receivable to denials, et cetera. So that's an area that you have to constantly pay attention to and look for improvements because those are revenues that are available to us if we're paying attention, uh, right? We provide the services, we expect reimbursement, and we need to make sure that we maximize that reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, the other area is around cost. So as this system has grown at the rate it's grown, uh, we're in this very uh, unique dilemma, which is you have to be able to staff your facilities in order to provide for that care. So your board last year, for example, approved a number of different clinical positions to deal with the increasing census. Um, frankly, I, I did not expect to be here today before you, anticipating that our volume would jump again as significantly as it did from year to year. Um, so it did not allow us to hire the staffing, stabilize the operations from a cost perspective because you have to use registry um, and other high cost um, means to, to, to balance the need in the operation. So we're, we're playing catch up relative to managing our cost. So our goal, for example, is to reduce the reliance on registry, which is high cost, reduce the reliance on overtime, et cetera. And so once we're able to stabilize the system from that perspective, then our cost per unit of service, our cost will go down and come more in line with our revenue or close the gap. I'm not saying it will absolutely, you know, eliminate that, that variance, but it will bring that variance down uh, from an operational financial perspective. Uh, so those are examples of things that we're focused on. Um, efficiencies, uh, which you hear Dr. Smith and you've heard Dr. Smith speak about, there are things that you could do in a hospital to improve operational efficiency to increase capacity and to improve timeliness of care, which is really what you know, we need to always be focused on. Mm -hmm. And so those actually do result in improved uh, financial performance as well, uh, making sure that people are discharged at an appropriate time so that we can get the next patient in, et cetera. So those are things that we're focused on from an operational perspective, and I, th I think you'll, uh, like I said earlier, see us more focused as we are able to be more attentive to these basic operational things. Good, thank you. Yeah, now business reimbursements is revenue, so obviously um, keeping track of that is extremely important. Um, on the other issue, on page 15, it talks about some of the difficulties in our healthcare supply chain. Um, could you explain or you know, shed some light on what are those difficulties? Yes, Super Supervisor Lee. So uh, I think it's no secret to, to anyone that's been following just generally speaking, uh, supply chain issues. In healthcare, we've had the same challenges. Um, fortunately, because you have today such a large system, a three hospital system, we've been able to build in some redundancy in terms of our supply chain. So although it's been a challenge within the industry, we've been very fortunate to be able to, to manage through it and to ensure that we have the appropriate supplies needed to, to provide for the services that we're providing today. Um, I think it was only indicated in the report to convey to you that, number one, it is a challenge within the industry in terms of supply chain and that we have to be constantly vigilant in making sure that we have the redundancies in place and operationally um, paying close attention to it. And when you say redundancy, I guess what you also mean by would be the increased inventories, for example, of certain supplies because, you know, for a long time back in the 80s and 90s, there's this thing called just in time. And just in time is great when everything's working smoothly, but when they're not, then we need to build in having some inventory existing so that uh, when things are being used, we, we, we are so that way we won't run out of things uh, when we need them. That's, I think, the bottom line. Um, of the six questions in the survey on under question number four, talks about recognition or praise in the last seven days of work. Uh, and the no, low number seems to be across the three hospitals. As we all know, recognition, of course, is a concern noted by healthcare employees here. Um, what would you recommend with ways to improve the overall recognition of our healthcare employees moving forward? So, um, I think, first of all, it's important for me to convey uh, that recognition of our staff who have worked so extremely hard. <laughs> 
over the past three years and continue to do so is really important. And, and, and although we, as an organization, um, have various types of programs to acknowledge staff, uh, one of the most important ways in which we can support our staff and have acknowledgement is at the actually departmental level. Uh, so acknowledgement, not only from the system, but from the peers and colleagues within the, their own department and give them the opportunity to, to stop and really reflect upon you know, the good work that they as individuals have accomplished, but they as a team has a, have accomplished. So we're looking to, to continue on with a variety of different recognition programs and grow others within the system. One of the programs that we're probably most proud of is called the DAISY Award, uh, where it's a nursing award in which we acknowledge a nurse that clearly has gone well above and beyond um, and has been acknowledged by a patient. Um, and we take the time to acknowledge not only that nurse, but make sure that everyone on a particular unit is aware of the fact that we're so fortunate to have such compassionate and caring uh, staff that are acknowledged by our patients. Um, and so that's one example where you know, we're really trying to you know, get in front of the staff and show that as an organization, we value them, but um, at the departmental level, amongst their colleagues, acknowledge them as well. There's definitely more to do, as we always do, and yeah. thank you. Uh, and that's all questions I have, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lorenz. Dr. Smith, do you have any comments on this item you'd like to share as well? I mean, we... Mr. Lorenz, I know, uh, has heard me say, repeatedly recall the fact that when we were in the process of acquiring these hospitals, I tried to temper my enthusiasm by noting that it was going to be a very big lift and a challenge for the organization, and I think that prediction has proven to be um, correct. But uh, Dr. Smith, your thoughts about where we are and where we're going and what we need to do and so on? Yes, um, I would say, um, as you appropriately recall, when we purchased these two hospitals, we were very concerned about the loss of access to health care for Medi-Cal, Medicare, and other uh, non-insured and minimally insured individuals. And uh, you remember that the census for both hospitals was very low, and they were... Um, the board was very concerned as we were administratively about how we could make sure that we could financially make it all work. Um, the fact that the census in both hospitals, actually all three hospitals, is quite high right now is um, good evidence that the need for the hospitals was continued and does continue now. And as a matter of fact, on an aside, we need more beds ourselves. But um, we were able to, because of that increased service level, make the um, cost pencil out to the degree that it does uh, normally for public hospitals. As you know, we always subsidize the enterprise fund with general fund because no matter how good we are at billing and, and gathering supplemental income, the rates for Medi-Cal, Medicare, and the supplemental incomes are not sufficient to pay for full service. So I think um, this report indicates exactly as you said that it was a challenging decision and easy to make from a political perspective, but hard to implement from an operational perspective. And I think we've done a really good job of it. Um, and just since I have the mic right now to uh, go back for a moment to the nurse practitioner model. Nurse practitioners are allied health professionals in the medical staff bylaws. They're not members of the medical staff in the sense that they don't vote, but they do have privileges that are um, created by the medical staff bylaws and they do have the opportunity to have input. 
So I just wanted to make it clear that's the appropriate intervention for a comment for the nurse practitioners. Dr. Smith or Ms. Lorenz, if you could comment a little bit on the um, potential looking ahead on the potential to further curtail the necessary subsidy. Uh, the economics of a public hospital are, are always a little um, challenging for me to explain uh, out in the community. I'll go to Ms. Hansen again with sidewalk office hours. And uh, you know, if somebody were to say to me, well, let me see if I got this right. You lose money on every patient, but you're gonna make it up in volume. How does that work? Hmm. Um, what's the answer to that question? Well, I'll try to answer that. Um, I have to give you the preemptive warning that if you understand healthcare finance, we'll have to treat you for the brain tumor that you have. <laughs> but uh, the basics are that um, there's a confluence of a bunch of different laws that evolved over many decades that create a system that we would never create de novo, but now it exists in such a way that it's very frustrating and confusing to understand. Basically, as best I can simplify it, um, when the state decided to get out of the Medi-Cal business by making counties responsible financially for the so-called local share um, the local share was matched by the federal share, typically 50-50%. And the state created a situation where they forced most Medi-Cal beneficiaries into a managed care system. Um, the feds at the same time were concerned about the viability of the delivery systems, the hospitals, and so they created disproportionate share funding, which was a way for them to subsidize providers that did a lot of Medi-Cal and Medicare. They also created federally qualified health center models, which was the same thing. So we have funding sources that come from Medi-Cal fee-for-service still, Medi-Cal managed care, which goes is funneled through family health plan and Valley Health Plan, um, and supplemental payments, which are negotiated during the waiver between, that's a contract between the state and the feds to allow the state to uh, not participate in certain regulations and create a system of service that's different than the rest of the nation. Part of that involves supplemental services that are related or supplemental payments that are related to just the number of patients that we see that are Medi-Cal and Medicare. Part of it is related to performance. Part of it is related to uninsured um, individuals. And when you put it all together, the rates that we receive always are less than our costs. And that's the same, that's true of all public hospitals in the state. So there's always some subsidy that needs to be added in order to pay for the entire cost. But contrary to what private hospitals have, they don't have all those supplemental funding mechanisms and disproportionate share funding mechanisms. So for them, Medi-Cal is much, much, much more of a lo loser than it is for us. So we don't make it up in volume, but we make more revenue by seeing more patients who are minimally insured. So is it, thank you, That's I find that helpful every time I ask for and get that refresher because um, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, puzzle pieces to fit together uh, on this one. So is it fair, well, let me, to strike that, is it accurate, looking at Mr. Lorenz and Dr. Smith both, um, to say that um, 
as a starting point, and I think uh, Supervisor Lee referenced this, um, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we actually bill charges because we can't get reimbursed if we don't bill the charges. Is that is that a starting point in the conversation, Mr. Lorenz? I remember a long ago conversation I think that you and I had with a whiteboard that involved some of this. Yes. And then do we typically collect more from commercial insurance in the way of uh, rates and reimbursements than we would from Medi-Cal or Medicare? On a fee-for-service basis, Yes, but collectively, as Dr. Spitz has described, relative to the Medi-Cal population, because of supplemental revenues, in some instances, um, our reimbursement uh, could be on par. Okay, and we're presumably much better off if we have Medi-Cal reimbursements than if we are providing care for someone who is otherwise indigent but doesn't have Medi-Cal for some reason, yes? Yes. And the, go ahead, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, and I would just say that uh, as part of our being a safety net hospital, when we serve the indigent, we do get credit for serving the indigent based on, and, and then that results in additional supplemental funding. Um, so it is part of the formula as a safety net hospital. That being said, we would prefer to have, excuse me, I shouldn't say it that way. Strike all that. That being said, it would be economically advantageous to have Medicare or Medi-Cal patients as contrasted with uninsured indigent patients, yes? Yes, that's true. Yes. But you're pointing out to me that from a purely financial standpoint, I should be mindful of the fact that there are essentially credits granted to us for our care to the indigent patient population when it comes time to calculate the supplemental payments, yes? That's correct. It is, Dr. Smith had indicated, this is an evolution of public hospital financing where public hospitals were acknowledged as serving not just those that, have, that are underinsured, Medi-Cal or in government sponsored program, but also serve the indigent. Okay. And just to make it more complicated, just so I improve your brain tumor, um, the supplemental payments um, are limited by the waiver in the sense that the state or the feds require that supplemental monies not increase the cost to the feds. Um, and so they have to calculate statewide what they would expect the fee-for-service cost would be for Medicare and Medi-Cal, and then not exceed that with the supplementals. However, through, through creative uh, financing and um, interesting presumptions, the pot of money that's available for supplementals is always higher than it uh, would be than if it was all fee-for-service. However, the, hos the public hospitals share that money and they share it based on the number of indigent and Medi-Cal patients they see. So for example, since we're the second largest <coughs> public hospital system in the state, our, for our portion of that supplemental care is considerably larger than most, not larger than LA. And so, for example, we generate supplemental payments that are higher than San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm a little far afield here, Dr. Uh, Smith and Mr. Lorenz, uh, in sort of uh, bouncing back and forth between the hospital integration per se and some of these questions about insurance and reimbursement rates, but I think you understand the connection that I'm making here in terms of the economic uh, solvency of the organization. I should mention to Supervisor Lee, um, Supervisor Lee, uh, you joined us, I think, following the 2020 election in 2019 when it uh, fell to me to deliver the state of the county address. Um, I chose to speak exclusively on the subject of healthcare that year. I don't remember if you were 
among those pre you were you were there's no reason that uh, anyone would recall but for for me that one of the things I talked about at that time was the importance of increasing our uh, numbers in Santa Clara County in terms of those who are insured. And I do think it's worth, because there are a lot of folks on this dais who played a role in this, taking a moment to point out, uh, and Dr. Smith, Ms. Lorenz, or anyone else, please correct me, but if I remember correctly, I think in 2010, a couple of years before I came on the board again, um, our probably 12% of the county was uninsured. Now, in a county our size, that's a lot of people. Um, it's, you know, 250,000 folks. Uh, by, you know, the most recent calculation, that number is down to 4%, um, which means we've cut the number of uninsured by two thirds, which is not a small accomplishment, everybody. So thank you, and Dr. Smith and Ms. Lorenz, uh, my um, sort of macro 30,000 foot assessment is that that's an important factor in the continued economic solvency of our hospital system. Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a good thing for our patient population, but it's also a good thing uh, for our hospital system. And then in addition, where we have folks, we still haven't been able to uh, pull into uh, an insurance program that works for them or that engages them. Uh, we've pursued other ways of making sure they get coverage, whether that's through just indigent care or the PCAP program or some other um, direct provision of services. So I think that's important. So with all of that said, and if you're wondering where is he going with this, <laughs> Dr. Smith and Mr. Lorenz, that where I'm going with this is so what are the chances that we could actually reduce the general fund subsidy over the course of the next couple of years? And if the answer is, you know, frankly, that's not likely given the circumstances, you know, please feel free to be candid. But I'm, I'm sitting here listening to Dr. Smith's uh, exhortations that our board should be mindful of a coming fiscal crunch given the changing economy and the state of the state's budget. And I'm wondering whether we might get a little relief or if we're gonna be even more stressed uh, in terms of the hospital system. Um, I guess I'll take that since I'm responsible for the, sub, or the subsidy. Um, the answer is the raw number of the size of the subsidy will increase um, because we're seeing more patients, the percentage of the um, relationship between the subsidy and the m amount of money that we generate by revenue has decreased significantly. So we're seeing more patients, we're generating more revenue, we're also generating more need for subsidy. Um, the future depends a lot on what decisions are made at the state and the federal level. Um, probably uh, Mr. Santiago can give you a more detailed answer or Mr. Margolin, but um, the basics are that each of these um, waivers have to be approved by both the state and the federal agencies and they fluctuate and there are new programs created on a regular basis and so to a great extent we're a little bit of a victim of the politics however the thing that we can control that will make sure that we're maintain solvency and provide services is the more access we can provide to our patients. So the more patients we have, the more Medi-Cal patients we have, the more Medicare patients we have, the better off we are. So I don't know, Renee, you wanna yes. give some more detail? Uh, Dr. Smith has uh, appropriately categorized it in terms of the dilemma that we face, because as you know, in some countries they would find abhorrent that people will make money off of sick, uh, hospital patients. 
But I think given what it is here in America, I think the, the formula that's driving our supplementals uh, are fed by the fact that we finance Medi-Cal. We put up the local non-federal share. So that will inevitably necessitate us putting you know, a subsidy, uh, whether it be realignment dollars to flow from the state of California or whether our own county general fund, uh, so that in fact we can draw the supplementals. That's the way the system works. And then the other piece, of course, is the cost of care. We, we, we live in a high cost of you know, standard of living here in our region. Uh, it's inevitable our doctors, our nurses, our, our support teams and frontline staff need increased uh, uh, wages uh, and, uh, in order to sustain uh, and li live in our communities. And those are good paying professional jobs. Uh, those are things that really contribute to the overall well-being of our communities. And I think in that particular case, it's not just an investment in healthcare, it's really an investment in the overall well-being of our communities. I think that's, that was the courageous act. I think uh, we were the only county that stepped in and bought uh, private hospitals. Uh, and I think, I still think it's, it's the right thing to do, very sound, because remember, those were nonprofit charitable assets. Uh, they were created to serve the public good, uh, particularly the most vulnerable. And the fact that our county stepped in, uh, not only saved the hospitals, provided jobs, and continued the services, but as you hear today, they continue to grow and serve more people. Uh, it's given us uh, enhanced capacities to respond to pandemics. Uh, and even very early on in the Gilroy shooting, uh, we're able to respond in partnership with our emergency personnel uh, to be available for immediate uh, critical care uh, for those that were impacted. So I think the over overall value, uh, quite honestly, has many more times returns in terms of uh, the investment that the board makes. All right, thank you very much. I don't believe we have any uh, members of the public who have uh, asked that, uh, for the opportunity to speak on this item, item number five. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? There are no additional cards on the desk. Okay. Then, uh, Supervisor Lee, a motion to receive the report. That is the recommended action. So moved. And I will second, and we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number six. Item number six is the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility, uh, long tight name, BHS Center on the SCVMC campus. And uh, we do have one card on this from a member of the public, Mr. Paul Soto. Mr. Soto, if you'd like to come up and speak for up to two minutes on this item, please, please do. And then uh, we'll ask for a staff presentation. Sure, uh, sure. Um, why don't we go ahead and have a staff presentation? Not yet. Here we go. There you go. Okay. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Doug Koenig, uh, uh, Deputy uh, uh, Director for Capital Programs. Uh, I only have a couple of updates to the report in your package. Uh, one, the installation of the shoring piles. Uh, for the excavation is complete. The excavation uh, is proceeding. Uh, the only uh, thing that I would note is the weather it has been having an impact on uh, the contractor's ability to, to maintain uh, his schedule. Uh, he is working through that and trying to, to mitigate the, the impacts of that, but there may be a potential for a delay in the handover uh, to the prime contractor. Are there any questions? I'm sure there are. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I was going to ask over regarding your handover at this point, but given the fact that the, the rain and all that's uh, happening right now, uh, how significant delay do you think it will happen at this point? But the, uh, the contract, like I said, is still, is still trying to do everything it can. Uh, okay. He's changing some of his uh, methods and procedures uh, in order to expedite uh, the removal of soil and, and transport to the landfill. He's he's uh, uh, he's mixing the the, the uh, extremely wet soil with lime uh, to get into a condition that the that the landfill will will accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's trying to mitigate his you know the, the impact to to his schedule from from that perspective. 
Uh, he's also, uh, while he may be delayed in the, in the actual excavation, uh, he is uh, taking on work that would have been part of the prime contractor's contract. Uh, an example of that would be uh, currently the, the site is, uh, is two or three feet below uh, what, the, uh, what the first floor slab elevation would be. Uh, so he uh, has changed his method, and instead of hauling off all the soil from the excavation, he's going to use that soil to uh, raise the level of the remainder of the site, and at the same time, he's bringing in a contractor to, uh, to do cement mixing, uh, also to uh, mitigate the impact of the, uh, uh, of the rains, but also to provide uh, a, a good working surface for the, uh, for the prime contract when, when he comes in that they can you know, hit the ground running. Good. Thank you. That's all I have. So at this point, is there any clear uh, understanding of the impact of the weather on the timeline that is in our packet? And the follow-up question will be um, on a more uh, immediate basis. I know there was... <laughs> was planned for some groundbreaking activity. I think it was on February the 13th. Yep. Uh, it's um, still a little soggy out there. How's that date looking? And so let me ask you the first big picture question, which is what's the long-term prognosis here in terms of our timeline that we've I been struggling? That, uh, if it's February 13th or February, that, that date may have changed. Uh, I got a different date today. But even if it's February 13th, the contractor, the current contractor, should have uh, completed the soil stabilization uh, on the west side of the of the site. Uh, and regardless, I think some of the sites they're considering to to uh, to to hold the ceremony, uh, if it is bad weather and and and, and it's not really uh, cleaned up, uh, they they are in paved areas. So I don't think, you know, other than the fact that it just rains on the, on the, the ceremony, uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And then more substantively, big picture, long term, I know you've been part of these discussions we've been having for some time now about, all right, where are we? When's it going to get started? Uh, what's the start date? I believe if I remember the chart correctly, we're now looking at uh, September 1st of 25 as a date when this uh, facility might be uh, open for business. Uh, any notion about whether or not we can um, mitigate the impacts of the recent weather or whether that's going to add some period of time to the current uh, anticipated start uh, open date? Uh, right now, I, I think that uh, the two contractors can, can work through this. Um, they uh, the, the contractor doing the make ready work is, has, has worked with the county for a long time. He, he has uh, uh, really uh, been creative uh, in how he's approached this. Uh, I mean, he's, he's gone to seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, he's, he covered the entire site with, with plastic when, when uh, rain was coming. He's, he's uh, created uh, river channels on the site to, 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 uh, to vacate the water as much as possible. Um, you know, he's come up with, with the idea of uh, the method to expedite the excavation. Uh, so uh, he's being creative, and I think that uh, uh, the follow-on prime con contractor, the building contractor, is also uh, looking at uh, uh, every, every means uh, that, that's available to him to, to expedite the project. Okay. Could we get... Um a report at our next meeting when you report in on this that is specific as to impacts or implications, if any, on the long-term date of the recent weather events. Certainly. Thank you. And then uh, could I just ask you in your office to be in touch with uh, Supervisor Lee and my office uh, to let us know if there's some place we should be on the 13th or the 22nd or a later date to be determined. Okay. All right. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee, other questions? Uh, no question. Ready for a motion to accept the report. Uh, we do have uh, outstanding public comment, and that is from um, Mr. Soto. Thank you. Thank you for that allowance, uh, Supervisor Smitty. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. 
Um, my questions or my statements are more related to what goes on inside the building rather than the construction of the building. I'm glad that we have it. Um, it's necessary. Uh, Juvenile Hall was used to deal with a lot of the quote unquote psychiatric issues that were experienced by the Chicano community back in the late 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, I was one of them. Um, there was probably at any given point in time, a couple of hundred children inside of Juvenile Hall, B1 through B6, I spent time in all of them. And the reason why I was there was simply because the tabs, there was this policy, a law, that stated that we're gonna go and pick up these kids because they're cutting school. That was my introduction into the system. And so, um, and it hasn't stopped since. I'm 54, still on probation. So I have a lot of experience with these kinds of facilities and experience with the lack thereof. And so, getting back to Dr. Sarah Cody's position on racism is a public health issue. There was, I'll never forget that quote because I was waiting for the memo to follow that. And I'm still waiting and I'm gonna continue waiting and I'm gonna continue pushing on it because I wanna see it. I wanna see this county's assessment of how racism has affected mental health and child adolescent development. And what, what impacts does that have on the life expectancy? What impact does it have on their viability as husbands and wives, their viability as functioning members of the communities in which they were raised. And I think those are legitimate questions to ask within the context of uh, uh, what's it called, the psychiatric behavioral health services, because I think we need to study the conditions in which they experience those health issues. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna confirm with the clerk, thank you very much, that we have no other speakers on this item. Clerk is confirming that. And we have a motion from Supervisor Lee and a second from myself. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Takes us to item number seven. And Dr. Cody, I think we turn to you for this one, yes? Yes, good afternoon, Chair Simidian, Supervisor Lee. It's um strange to be here in person. I have a verbal report for you on COVID. Um, since I'm no longer giving formal reports to the full board, if at any time in the future you would like slides or something more formal, uh, please let me know. In general, uh, the trends, every, all the indicators um, are trending uh, downwards, in other words, in a positive direction. Um, uh, as you know, we are following our wastewater most closely. I think it's the most accurate indicator. And as of today, interestingly, all four sewer sheds are now in what we're defining as medium. Uh, Palo, the Palo Alto sewer shed was the last to follow. All of these are a little bit bumpy, so it doesn't mean that something, you know, one might bump back up into high, but overall, bumpy course, but overall down. Um, as far as the other viruses that we're really concerned about and have been following, um, RSV probably peaked in November and came down, uh, flu in December and is continuing to come down. And COVID, I'm not quite sure when it peaked, but it's now coming down. Um, this is now being reflected in hospitalizations. We're seeing fewer hospitalizations um, uh, uh, for COVID and with COVID than we had in the past. And as you um, know from three years of following the data, the last indicator that we will see is uh, deaths. So mm -hmm. we've already seen um, a little bump um, reflecting the significant um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 activity over the winter, um, but I hope, but certainly nothing like the bumps that we've seen before and hopefully coming down. Um, as far as our response activity, um, just to know that over time, we have in, uh, been folding the response activities into the normal daily operations of the public health department. So most of the response is now done with a COVID prevention and control program that sits within the infectious disease and response branch. They continue to work directly with schools, hospitals, healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities. Um, and their reports um, also are that there's less activity in all of those settings as well, which is good news, and they continue to support them um, as needed. As far as vaccination, 
Um, overall, the, you know, the vaccinations that we're watching most carefully, of course, is the bivalent booster rates and the trends that we, they in large part sort of reflects the trends that we saw when we were following uh, fully vaccinated or had your first booster or had your second booster in that the rates are, the uptake is greater the older that you get and the uptake tends to be greater in North and West County as compared to East and South County. So those trends hold, but overall with a bivalent booster, the uptake is just less overall. So countywide, it's still hovering around just a little north of 30%. Um, and, but again, the uptake is greater in the older populations, uh, which is good. Um, and it's greater in some parts of the county as far as, um, as compared to others. So maybe the best is for me to uh, take questions. Tell sure, me what I've, got, I've got just a question or two, Dr. Cody, thank you. I'll turn to uh, Supervisor Lee in a moment. And um, then uh, before we wrap up, I do wanna have a brief conversation uh, with the committee and uh, the team here to uh, talk a little bit about what it would be useful to do on a monthly basis now that <clears throat> the monthly reports are no longer taking place at the full board level. Um, at a prior meeting of this committee, I asked if you all in public health could make available to us off agenda a, uh, a simple one page uh, indication of uh, the percentage of folks who had received the bivalent booster dose uh, as a percentage of the population on a city by city basis. And it, it uh, um, I found it very helpful. You were kind enough to provide that, provided it very quickly, so thank you for that. The most recent version I have is from December 7th, uh, and I wonder if we could simply ask you for an updated version of that city by city bivalent booster, I'm gonna call it the take-up rate uh, in each of the cities and a couple of unincorporated areas as well. Is that something that uh, would be uh, readily available, say, by close of business this Friday? This is Wednesday? Yes. All right, if we could ask for that, that would be helpful. And, and it does give both, uh, you know, I, I ask in part because as you may or may not recall, I represent uh, all are part of nine different cities now, so I'm trying to keep track of how folks are faring in different parts of my district. But it also reinforces, as you point out, the fact that we've got uh, a particular challenge still in front of us in uh, the east part and the south part of the county that I know we're gonna wanna focus on as well. Um, why don't I just uh, ask one more question about the wastewater samples. I never thought this was what I would do when I got to the Board of Supervisors, Dr. Cody, but here we all are together. Um, as I look at the chart that I think, let me just look to my staff, um, that we pulled down from online, so it's readily available, it does reflect the fact that in the four sewer sheds, um, the virus concentration levels from the various uh, samples are medium uh, in all four of the sewer sheds. As I'm looking at the chart, it strikes me that there, as a North County representative now, I, that there are sort of two good things going. Um, one is that the concentration level is just dramatically lower than it was before. Not yet where we want it, but dramatically lower than where it was before. And that while it is still somewhat higher than San Jose, Sunnyvale, and Gilroy sewer sheds, um, the, the difference is not as dramatic or great uh, as it once was, which would explain why L4 are medium now as opposed to, I think previously Palo Alto was the only one in the high category. Am I remembering this correctly? That's correct. Okay. So I just, I'm just, frankly, I'm just using you to uh, help proof my homework here and make sure that I right. am reading the materials correctly. All right, and um, did you ever, uh, I mean, I, I know we looked at the list of uh, cities that were part of that sewer shed, including across the county line into uh, East Palo Alto and San Mateo County, but did you ever re reach even a hypothesis about what might be pushing that number up? I know when we talked about it before, people were pretty much scratching their heads saying hard to, hard to 
really offer a conclusion or even a, uh, an educated hunch. Yeah, we, we, we never did um, settle on a, a, a clear and definite explanation. Um, I do know that, so as I think we've talked about before, now we are essentially seeing a variant soup with so many different um, variants and subvariants of, of Omicron, the, the tree just keeps branching. And the relative contributions of different subvariants are different by sewer shed. So some subvariants are more infectious and more easily transmitted than others, and that could drive up levels in one sewer shed as compared to another, just sort of reflecting whatever the dominant variant is that's circulating in a, in a community. Um, but as far as what do we do about that, um, as the county and the public health department, it's, it's the same strategies, which is continuing to recommend layered mitigation strategies and to pay attention to what the, the, um, the exposure risks are wherever it is that you live. All right, thank you. Supervisor Lee, questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, thank you. Uh, great to see you in person, Dr. Cody, and I'm um, uh, really glad to be here in person. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for all your great work uh, on all these amazing uh, uh, times in person. Uh, and also uh, to hear about the fact that the, um, you know, we just had a holiday, uh, lots of indoor gathering, uh, these extreme weather we've been going through. Uh, it certainly to me sounds like it's good news that all four, you know, uh, areas that we're tracking on, the, on this wastewater uh, that our numbers are medium and not much higher as we potentially could have expected in the winter months. Um, and the, uh, uh, in despite of some of the new variants that we're seeing that is very uh, contagious, uh, so far we look like we're holding pretty well there. Uh, is that a good read of these numbers? Well, I, I think what I would say is um, the trend line is fantastic because they're all going down. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it's bumpy. They go up and down. And I wouldn't really say that the, the risk of exposure is still pretty significant. Um, so I always think about that it's, it's, it's very dynamic because there's the amount of virus that's circulating and the exposure risk but also the population, um, we have a pretty good immunity wall through vaccination and natural infection. Many people have been in, you know, both vaccinated and infected, um, vaccinated multiple times, infected multiple times. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of immunity, which is why we've not seen the same impact in our hospitals um, and our morgues, even though the levels as reflected in the sewer sheds were far higher um, recently than they were, you know, in, in the Palo Alto sewer shed, the, hires for, the levels were higher than they were even during the Omicron peak. Um, so anyway, the, the dynamics have changed and I think they've changed in our favor, um, but it's still the case, mm -hmm. of course, that people who are, are most vulnerable and aren't gonna do well and they get sick um, do need to layer up and avoid getting exposed in the first place because the, the risk out there is still Significant. Right. And then in, in, the, in terms of the uh, subsequent booster, you, we do see that older adults uh, are higher in terms of percentages of uh, getting these boosters, and that's certainly very good news. That's correct. Right. As opposed to, for example, like in China, where they initially only vaccinated the younger people first, and I think they are definitely seeing the problem with that approach, um, and, and that's really, really unfortunate. Um, a question regarding the um, the timing of getting boosters. I, I've read something about it will be at least three months to get a booster. So for example, I pull my own vaccine cards, just remind myself. My first dose was back in March 21. Remember, it was about two years ago when the first vaccine arrived to this county, right, in January 2021. Uh, so uh, counting, I already received apparently five doses, uh, and the last one being October 22. Um, when would a person who get the latest booster should expect to line up to get another booster? Is that six months or what's the um, ongoing recommendation moving forward? So right now the only booster available is the bivalent booster and we don't have any guide, no guidelines have, have come out um, as yet as to uh, a second bivalent booster or another booster of another type. So we won't know till 
sometime in the future. In the future. So right now, basically, that's basically the last one that you should be able to get, and after that, uh, you won't be getting any. Uh, uh, kind of a disturbing news that I've been hearing the last couple of days is regarding the cost of Moderna and Pfizer vaccine uh, moving toward a commercial cost of over $120 a dose uh, because of the fact that eventually the expectation is that the federal government is not going to pay for every single dose moving forward. So I just want to know, uh, is this something that we need to be concerned about? And uh, on this cost of vaccine, how that might affect us financially, or is this something TBD in the future? Well, I think I would turn to Dr. Smith uh, for thoughts on, on that question of when the um, vaccine becomes commercialized and uh, how, we'll, how, we'll balance, how we'll balance that. How will that affect our bottom line? Mm -hmm. um, at this point, it's hard to tell. Um, I think all of the insurance um, programs are required to pay for it. So for all of our insured individuals, which includes Medi-Cal, Medicare, um, there will not be significant impact upon us. For the uninsured, there might be um, and there might be co-pays involved depending on the particular insurance plan, but I don't expect a huge impact on the enterprise fund. Oh. Okay, good, because do you, do you believe that this will be reimbursed by the government or federal government, or how is that gonna work? Reimbursed because by the health plans. The health plans to, to us Yes. at the end of the day, okay. All right, and the last issue, we haven't talked about it, and I know we talk about some STD issues later, and MPOX is something that uh, we discussed a few months ago, and it seems like the number has gone down. Would you say that those numbers are still continue to trend down? Yes, um, and uh, Dr. Redman, who's here, can comment more about that, as she knows the details, but the, the bottom line is we're seeing uh, only sporadic cases of MPOX um, in our county and in California. Um, but we are con the and the uptake of the mpox vaccine has has also the demand has also declined um uh, but we still still do a trickle and we have plenty of them basically right yes great thank you all good all good that's all i have thank you very much all right uh that i think means we are ready to turn the conversation to what would it be helpful to have in the future um, and I think, Dr. Cody, if we could ask you and your team to deliver, and you know, I'm not uh, picking an arbitrary number out uh, of the blue with any precision, obviously, but I'll just say typically a half dozen mm -hmm. sort of slides that you think um, would convey both to the committee and the team here, but also to members of the general public, sort of where we are and if there's news about where we're headed or thoughts you want to share about where we're headed, you know, action items for the future, whether that's because there's a new uh, booster available or because, um, God help us, we had to uh, surge again at the hospitals or whatever that might be, certainly would want to have that presented. But I think, you know, a half dozen relatively crisp, straightforward, um, uh, pages of uh, bullet points would probably be the best way to make sure that we um, cover all areas that we should, including, and, and I would say, I think, you know, if you think the sewer shed is sort of a good way of giving us a regional look, I'm not, I'm not uh, prepared to be the judge of which is the best tool. I'll let you and your team uh, make that judgment. But we'll be seeing more sewer data in the future. All right, thank you. If that's the best way, that's the best way. <laughs> All right, does that give you enough clarity about what we might like to see in the future? And I think um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody, if, it, if it, it isn't problematic, I think we ought to just consider th that as something that should be shared with all five supervisorial offices uh, as a off agenda, even though for us it'll be on agenda here. I don't know what we call that, but I do think the other offices are gonna wanna have access to the same information, and hopefully for them it'll be sort of a quick way to tap into the pulse of um, what's happening with uh, COVID for the foreseeable future. Yes, okay. we'll do that. All right. Could then, I also make a general comment when please you're Please do. Um, usually we don't respond to 
public comments, but having heard a number of questions about the relationship between public health and racism, I wanted to direct people to quite a bit of work that the public health department has been doing for over a decade that's all on our website under the public health department's uh, page under health data. There have been multiple assessments of communities of color and you know communities that have poverty issues and child care issues and other behavioral risk factors and the impact that that has on their health. And so um, they're all very good reviews that the public health department has done involving numerous ways of collecting data. And I think the summary is that it's clear that um, racism is uh, clearly a public health impact and causes uh, major disease and problems in the health of individuals who are subject to racism. And uh, I encourage everybody to read those. Thank you, it's also part of our strategic plan. Thank you, thank you both. And uh, Supervisor Lee, can we go ahead and uh, Do we have a motion on the on this item? We do not yet. So uh, I'll go ahead and move to accept the report, which is uh, on item number seven. Yes. I will second. We have the comments from Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody. Uh, we have clarity about what we'd like to see in the future on this item. So please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. All right. That takes us to item number eight, uh, which is the uh, annual report on SD, uh, STI, HIV, and HCV prevention and control. And Dr. Cody, I think uh, we turn to you again for the initial presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Sarah Redman, who you may know uh, since we were last in chambers, Sarah has a different role. She had uh, served as our STI, STI and HIV controller and she's now the deputy health officer for the public health department. Um, so she's gonna provide um, an update for us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cody. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, Mr. Vice Chair. So you have the full reports in front of you that uh, give a great amount of detail about the ways in which the public health department has flexed and expanded and evolved services to respond to the rising concerns around STIs and around opioid and other substance use and the related infectious disease and overdose concerns. So I'll just highlight two or three points about sort of the setting in which these changes have occurred and then take your questions. Um, so I want to highlight that prior to the pandemic, we had been seeing record high rates of every bacterial STI we follow. That's chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis. These had been rising across the country and here locally for almost 20 years. Now what we saw in 2020 was that the number of reported cases dropped significantly. And at the time I came to you and said, I'm worried that that's bad news, not good news. That's not that there's uh, changes in sexual activity, decreased disease, that's actually just decreased diagnosis. Fewer people are getting tested and therefore getting treated and so we aren't hearing about it. So what we saw in 2021 was the numbers did bounce back up, not quite to pre-pandemic levels, uh, but uh, approaching them in most diseases and most populations and still in the setting of decreased testing plus some additional data that tell us that there really was a uh, decreased or later diagnosis happening in 2020. Now for HIV, we had seen fairly level uh, numbers of new diagnoses year over year for the, the prior decade, if not closer to 20 years, um, which wasn't the good news of decreasing levels we would have liked to see, but not quite as dire. And again, we saw that drop in 2020 that rebounded back up in 21 that we feared was due to people not getting diagnosed, not that they weren't getting HIV. And we now have some data that tell us uh, more explicitly that folks who were diagnosed in 2020 were much, likely, much more likely to already have an AIDS diagnosis or to progress to one within that year, which tells us that we were indeed only t diagnosing the people who were quite sick at that time, not the people who had newly acquired HIV. And I've just seen the preliminary numbers for 2022, although they're not complete, we have really rebounded um, to pre-pandemic levels for new HIV diagnoses. But I think what's most worrisome in the background with respect to STDs and HIV 
is the disparities that persist and actually worsen by race and ethnicity, as well as by sex, gender, and orientation. So this is just one example showing when you look at early syphilis among males, that rates among African Americans are much higher than among Latino men, which are much higher than among white and Asian men. And in fact, while we've seen pretty steady rates among white men, we've seen growing rates among all populations of color. And that's true to varying degrees across most of these diseases and uh, most of these subpopulations. I'll switch now to talk about, again, concerning background to uh, the, the need for our ongoing harm reduction program, which serves people who use drugs to help them both uh, do so in as safe a way as possible while we help to get them ultimately to substance use treatment and recovery. What you see here is that year over year, the blue bars show us that more and more people have engaged with our harm reduction services. Um, we did see a drop off in 2020 when we had to scale back certain services that rebounded quickly in 21 and then a dramatic increase again in 22. Um, we actually so much have expanded the program that the costs have over doubled in the last year to operate the program. But there's one piece that feels like good news to me, and that's the orange line here, which is the number of syringes distributed. So even though the number of people we served with the program increased significantly, the number of syringes we distributed actually decreased. And we think that is good news because that reflects two things. One, uh, we've begun offering what we call alternatives to injection, supplies that help people, if they are going to use drugs, do so in the safest way possible, ideally not injecting at all, but choosing to snort or inhale drugs instead, uh, which is a not only much lower risk for infectious disease, but much lower risk for overdose and death. And so we think people are either choosing not to inject at all or choosing to inject less frequently because of this added service. And the last thing I'll add as background um, is that we for many years have operated uh, additional services specifically targeted to reduce the risk of overdose and overdose death for this population. As you know, the highly potent drug fentanyl is out there contaminating almost every kind of drug so that people are both utilizing it accidentally as well as on purpose. And so we've increased our distribution of fentanyl test strips almost seven fold over the last two years to help people at least know what they're injecting and be able to do so as safely as possible while they work towards recovery. And then our distribution of naloxone to reduce, reduce overdoses or um, reverse overdoses has actually increased 30 fold in the last two years. Um, and you'll see here there's a much greater uh, request for intranasal naloxone that can be injected up someone's nose instead of into their muscles, which you can imagine uh, is maybe easier to administer for a lot of populations, especially during an emergency situation, but is also much more expensive than the intramuscular injection. Mm. Now, the last piece I'll share with you is that just from this program and just from the people who choose to return to us and self-report what's happened to them, we have heard of 337 reversals of overdoses just in the last year. So while it's tragic that those near overdoses have happened, that is potentially 337 life-saving interventions that just this program, um, which is a portion of the county's naloxone distribution, has been able to provide. So just to highlight a few of the many ways these programs have expanded in the last year, we continue to focus on responding to these rising rates of STIs by maximizing our current personnel and really trying to streamline and modernize the way in which we provide services like disease investigation, uh, intervention with individual cases, and contact tracing. We have, as uh, Dr. Cody was alluding to, integrated our MPOX response into our sexual health and harm reduction program because of the overlap of populations impacted and the risk of sexual transmission. We've launched a new HIV and aging program to respond to the fact that people with HIV are living longer, healthier lives, but that also leaves them with a unique set of needs we hope to meet. And we continue to expand our harm reduction services, including uh, expanding collaboration with our behavioral health services partners. And I'll end there and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Could we go back to slide number two, please? So uh, the trend line here is obviously a source of considerable concern. First question is, if I were looking at data from other counties and other states, would I see similar trend lines? Yes, nearly identical patterns across all of California and all of the United States. Okay. Then the next question is, um, 
given that uh, we're looking at a 10-year trend line here, um, there's been plenty of time to talk about this on a national level. So if somebody said, well, what's the current thinking about best practices to address this really rather extraordinary and troubling trend line, um, what are you hearing or thinking? I think that um, while the reasons we've seen these trends are incredibly complex and historically long trending, um, the, the big picture sort of could be boiled down to stigma around uh, sexual activity in general and STIs specifically, some of the discrimination that explains and racism that explains the, um, the dramatic disparities we see by race and ethnicity and sexual orientation and gender, um, and then general access to care and specifically primary care and sexual health care. So those three uh, root causes translate to some of the activities we've been doing in response. So to combat stigma, I think it's really a mix of education. Dr. Robin, oh. excuse the interruption, but I just, I'm, 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 you're losing me here on a, oh. on a piece of this and I wanna make sure I track. Excuse me. But I, I didn't hear, of those three factors, I didn't, and correct me if I'm just not aware, none of those strike me as new. You are absolutely right. So, not. so that does not explain why. Mm. It, it might explain why something was persistent, but it doesn't explain why the you know numbers are dramatically higher. I mean, I'm uh, you know I'm looking at um, <clears throat> you know the trend line for I think it's gonorrhea that's uh, you know gone from 995 cases to. Uh, 2,366 cases, that's, you know, more than 100% increase, and yet I, I don't think you would attribute it to any change in those three factors that you identified. I'm not saying the three factors aren't prevalent, I'm just saying mm -hmm. I think they were prevalent a decade ago and maybe even worse. I think you're, um, I agree with you. And I'm not sure I have an explanation for yeah. why these haven't improved, uh, despite I think, especially locally, some of these very targeted efforts we've had that are evidence-based and, and uh, invested in. I think if I were to hypothesize, it would be um, that we have insufficiently responded to those three factors. That while we may be taking some of the right steps, not just locally, but uh, you know, around the state, in our neighboring areas, and across the country, that they've been insufficient to bend the curve that we've been seeing. And, um, and I wanna make sure I let you get back to wherever the rest of the, mm -hmm. but I, I wanna ask you and Dr. Cody and Dr. Smith and the whole team to, to think about this, which is, I think, you know, if, if I, I, I was gonna say we, but I can't obviously speak for others. I think if, um, if you, if I had some, you know, clear evidence that simply doing more of the same was gonna solve the problem or reverse the trend, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say let's do it and we'll figure out, you know, where to find the resources to do it. Um, but I worry sometimes in all the decisions we make, I'm not picking out this particular set of challenges or public health or healthcare, I just, you know, there is a, a tendency to think, well, whatever I'm doing isn't working, so if I just keep doing more of it, that will somehow solve the problem. And of course, more of something that's not working may get you to a critical mass, may help you reach a tipping point in terms of having an ameliorative impact, but it may not. So I just want to encourage the organization and you know that's why I asked about nationally. It's like it's you know we got talented people here, we got talented people throughout the state, we got talented people throughout the country. If nobody's come up with a clear understanding of the nature of the problem or what the solution is, because the trend line keeps going in the wrong direction with that uh, COVID blip there, um, I would encourage everyone to sort of think about: Are there dramatically different ways to confront these challenges? that you know are worth trying that are worth piloting uh I, you know obviously i don't know that's why i'm asking so i see dr smith leaning in Sh shall we go to your phone a friend here and see what he has to say yes, <laughs> well, i'm smith? not a i'm not a real doctor and i'm not a public health specialist but 
I will comment that um, we might learn a lot about this particular situation with syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia by looking at HIV. Um, the nation and the world put in a huge effort to try to come up with preventative measures for HIV, and we saw a pretty dramatic downturn in um, infections and risky behavior before we started seeing treatment options. Once we started seeing treatment options, people generally thought, well, it's not deadly anymore, it can be treated, and we've seen upticks um, in, in uh, behavior that's risky. Um, the reason I say that is because all of these diseases are treatable, and I think there is a tendency for the younger population to believe, well, you know, if I get it, you know, it'll be treated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, all of our warnings and concerns and expressions of, you know, long-term medical illness are um, short-circuited by the young people feeling invulnerable and feeling like they can be treated if they get infected. I have a slightly, uh, something else to offer that may be in addition to additive, but I see many of these um, infections and trends in infections as indicators and reflections of sort of more societal ills and they really reflect <laughs> our inability to tackle the social determinants of health. Uh, and so when we see a rise in syphilis um, or gonorrhea or HIV, that frequently reflects some larger societal ill that we've not really been able to get our arms around um, and address. So, uh, I mean, you, you could also, we, d we don't, we also don't have the counterfactual so if we hadn't been doing what we're doing, what would it have looked like? It's diff sometimes difficult to see what it is that we've prevented, um, how much worse it, uh, it might have been, or you know, maybe not as much as we like to think. Um, but I, I, you know, more and more in public health, we're trying to think about how do we think about um, communities of people and what, um, what the infections are or other risks or other diseases or other types of suffering and how do we address it more holistically um, rather than going disease by disease by disease. Um, and it is also important that we have, um, you know, we, we also know that for many of these treatment is prevention and if you can treat someone who's infected, you can prevent spread to somebody else. Uh, so bo both are true. That's my me, reflections on your question. Thank you. Let me ask you to go back, and forgive me, I don't have the page number handy. Uh, to, uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. So, um, I'm, I'm looking at... Um, ah, this is for harm reduction. If we can go back then to where we were. Um, do we have a dollar amount that we attach to the efforts to reduce the incidence of SDIs? Um, the operating costs of the sexual health and harm reduction program as a whole are on the order of 12 to 13 million, about uh, six and a half of which is uh, grant funds, either state or federal. And if I were to ask you, how has that grown between 2012 and today, what would you tell me, Dr. Rodman? Considerable growth uh, on the order of 30, 40%. Yeah, and I, I don't want you to get the wrong impression from this question that I'm pushing on, but, you know, and, and on a very serious note, uh, Ms. Hansen, if I were at sidewalk office hours and somebody walked up to me and said, I don't understand what's going on, you've doubled the amount of money you're spending trying to control SDIs, but the you know rate is more than doubled in the intervening decade. I think the answer to that is, well, yes, that's true. And then the next question is, why would you keep doing that? 
And I'm curious, Dr. Smith or Dr. Rodman or Dr. Cody, what would our answer to that question be from a layman's perspective? I might say, and I think there's, there's much more detail in the reports about this, that the strategies have shifted. And to your point about do we need a um, radical or even partial uh, reimagination of where we intervene and how, I do think that has been happening, although slowed to some extent by the pandemic and in other ways actually promoted by it. We're understanding, as Dr. Cody was describing, that these may be reflections of uh, the way people have access to primary care overall, the way people talk about sexual health and autonomy and safety overall, uh, the way discrimination impact interpersonal interactions. We have been able to integrate those to a greater and greater extent in how these programs operate. I think some of the ways that plays out are greater community involvement in the services themselves. So for example, in the last year, we've instituted a youth and young advisory board, uh, youth and young adult advisory board that guides every effort to say, this is what 16 to 20 year olds are talking about right now and this is how you need to talk to us to change how we behave. And similarly with harm reduction, we've instituted a uh, drug user health advisory council to say this is what people who are choosing to use drugs today are experiencing and this is how you help us do so more safely while we get to recovery. So there have been some shifts there. Another major shift I think has also been interacting with our care provider partners in a different way. Um, moving upstream from helping them to provide gap care, which is still a considerable piece of what we do, to helping to routinize sexual health care as part of overall primary care. So for example, in the last few years, um, the county health and hospital system has instituted universal HIV testing for all adults as just a simple part of routine care no matter what is happening in your healthcare. And that has made a really dramatic difference in being able to diagnose people early on with HIV. We're having similar conversations with our uh, emergency care settings now as well because we know so many people that's their only point of access to care. So some of those strategies are shifting to try to move upstream and impact direct, directly sort of uh, the, the stigma, the discrimination itself. Well, I, I'm just gonna close with this and then turn to uh, Supervisor Lee. I, um, thank you, the conversation has been helpful and the hypotheses have been helpful and, you know, Dr. Cody heard what you said about, you know, there are some larger forces out there that, you know, are societal, social determinants of health that, uh, you know, um, no one county is gonna be able to uh, counter uh, and, um, the, you know, the inability to know, well, what would it have looked like if we hadn't done the good work that's been done and Dr. Smith's comment about, you know, what I will characterize as the young invincibles. But, you know, there is an apt cliche for this moment, which is we keep doing what we're doing, we're gonna keep getting what we got. And I think everybody is looking at the chart and having the same conclusion, which is, you know, we're not only getting what we got, we, we, it's getting worse with every passing day. So I really am wanting to sort of use this time to exhort you all to rethink the response. Um, you know, I know that's been a little hard to find time for the last few years uh, for obvious reasons, but um, you know, I just hope that uh, 10 years from now, somebody isn't sitting here looking at a trend line that looks more or less the same. And if that, if that requires some radical thinking, then uh, it, it's, I think after a decade, you might conclude it's time. To you, Supervisor Lee. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, huge topic, first of all, thank you very much for the very informative report. This is extremely helpful to understand, extremely difficult uh, issue, uh, and it, it's, interconnect not just STD, but also regarding drug use, which is of course another big issue. Let me hit the drug use issue first, and I'll go back to the STD. Um, you mentioned that the, uh, uh, you saw uh, Nalexin, I, I call it Narcan, same thing, right, basically. Uh, is There are two types, there's a nasal spray and there's intramuscular, and one is much more expensive than the other. Uh, could you explain the, the delta in cost? I don't have that number in front of me. I can get back to you with that. Okay, sure. But this is, uh, uh, yeah, so it would be nice to know that. And also, uh, in terms of administering uh, this Narcan, um, is there any difference? Uh, is this something that uh, one would be easier to be administered and whether one could be administered by itself or has been immersed by somebody else? Yes, yeah, so in any overdose situation, one of the most important factors is to have someone else there. The person who is overdosing cannot treat themselves. Um, so that's part of the the 
basics of the program to train anybody, not just those who use drugs themselves, but who may be around others who do to respond. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to your point, the intranasal uh, really involves sort of, it's the same as using a, a flow nase or another um, nasal spray that someone might have used before. Uh, there's no facility with syringes needed. It's a single step, take off the cap and squirt it in someone's nose. The intramuscular injection, some of them uh, are as simple as an EpiPen, pulling off the cap and injecting them, but most also require that you actually draw up a medication and administer it. So two or three steps requires use of needles, requires familiarity with the equipment, and therefore may be much harder to do in an emergency. Great. And for nasal spray to work, obviously, the person has to be a breathe, right? Uh, if well, actually, it does absorb in through the nasal mucosa. So even if the person has stopped breathing, it uh -huh. can still be helpful. Oh, wow. Okay, good. That's, that's good to know. Even that will work. Um, and you mentioned that there has been 337 interventions uh, recorded. So that's potentially 337 lives that's been saved uh, at this time. And I've, I have made it a, 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 a very big issue previously regarding getting Narcans to our schools. Uh, so we're getting them to the high schools and now reaching out even to middle schools as well. Uh, one question that's been keep coming back is how is that distribution being equitable to make sure that some schools might have a greater number of needs, so they really shouldn't be just an equal number being distributed, but really based on the need. As they said, no, equality is not equitable. So is there a way we are doing a better job to make sure that distribution is equitable, that's really going to places that's needed? So public health is one of a group of partners who are all working together to really dramatically expand access to Narcan or Naloxone. I think the direct uh, collaboration with schools is happening primarily through our behavioral health partners, so I'll let them speak to any details. Um, our work with our harm reduction population, people who choose to come seek our services because they are choosing to use drugs right now, um, we enhance equity through several mechanisms. I think our Drug User Advisory Council, paying attention to the geographic needs of where our patients are, and then um, meeting their, their needs, not just for their um, uh, naloxone or overdose prevention, but also for safer injection, alternatives to injection, integrated STI testing, and other services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, um, moving to the other issue, um, we uh, talk about with the STDs, and we have seen all the, the data that is being presented, which of course is uh, very disconcerting. Uh, and the reasoning, right? And the report has mentioned that you know maybe a tailgate party from a game uh, or, or situations where you might see a greater number. We expect like maybe for behavior of these uh, as uh, supervisors. Uh, uh, so many mentioned the young invisibles, right? Whether it's through Tinder dating, uh, or if you listen to, you know, I've been having three daughters, it really worries me when I listen to those pop music lyrics that practically normalizing very risky sexual behavior uh, as, as commonly acceptable. And so it really boils down to education and, and, and getting rid of these myths. Like some myths I would be hearing is, say for example, uh, you only need condoms when you're having intercourse. If you are having uh, oral sex, it's okay. Uh, you don't need, and that's absolutely completely false, right? But these are the type of stuff that's that's out there. Uh, how exactly are we doing to 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 educate our kids and, and young adults uh, of how risky these behaviors are? Why condoms so important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, public health takes several tacks to both uh, participate in that kind of education as best we can, but then also empower communities, schools, uh, education experts, community centers to do that work themselves as well. Um, we're fortunate in California that there is a, the California Healthy Youth Act requires comprehensive sexual health education in our public and chartered schools in a way that addresses the level of nuance, the level of myth busting that you're describing, Supervisor. Um, and I think it has been one of our explicit roles to assess how well that's happening in Santa Clara County, to bring in support, whether that's curriculum, parent nights, um, at times direct funding to schools to be able to provide that level of education. Great, thank you. And I mean, there's so many more questions I have, but I know we have a 4.30 uh, cut off today, so I just end it right there. But thank you very much, Dr. Redman, and uh, for the Team Public Health on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We do have a request to speak from one member of the public, and that would be uh, Mr. Paul Soto. Mr. Soto on this item, item eight. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you for that report. It, it was uh, consistent with what we experience in the barrios, and uh, especially uh, uh, Dr. Smith, thank you for that. Uh, um,
This is data that we don't need as Chicanos. We already know what time it is and what's happening in our communities and what has happened over the past 80 years. What we're looking for is concrete policy that addresses that. We don't need more data, the, obviously, from what uh, Dr. Smith had stated. So let me give an example. We have a population of 1.8 million people in Santa Clara County. We have 18 detox beds. That is disgusting. That is a disgusting fact. 18 detox beds for a population that large? Let me give you another example. We only have eight for women. Only eight. But yet, women comprise 50% of the population. Another disgusting fact. So when we're talking about racism and, well, yes, it affects this, it affects that, it affects this, not nah, Charlie, it affects the quality of life and the ability for a citizen in this county to access health care. If I want recovery right now today, I want recovery right now, I can't get it. But if I have a broken arm, if I have a, a, a COVID issue or anything like that, I go to a hospital, I get treated. That's not so for addiction recovery, which is a health issue. cal -AIM is trying to address that, but the county is dragging its feet. Do you know how long this county had only 10 detox beds for a population of Santa Clara County, which at that time it was 1.5? We had it for 30 years, 30 years. Horizon South, I know because I dated one of the counselors there. And this is what the population was. This is how many beds there were. So we need, some, we need some detox beds and residential treatment beds. Thank you very much. Confirming with the clerk, that was our only speaker, Dr. Robin. Thank you very much. Dr. Cody, Dr. Smith, others, thank you as well. Uh, motion to receive the report from uh, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Yeah, so before I make this motion, I do have a request here. So uh, looking at the work regarding harm reduction program, uh, alternative to the uh, uh, IV drug use is certainly extremely important, uh, especially in light of the recent spike on the overdose death. Um, the report talks more about the need for more funding and more FTE positions to expand reach and frankly, you know, to prevent burnout for our current staff. Um, looking at the number right now, it's only about a little over a million dollars on the budget, which frankly is very small, and I think we certainly can do more. So I would like to make a motion to accept the report, but also to come back to our next budget hearing on a proposed increase of the EFT positions and funds needed in order to run these programs even more effectively. Could we, could I persuade you to just say a budget proposal and not presuppose the increase? Yeah, budget proposal to look at what could be increased. Thank you. Could I persuade you to take the word increase out so that if there's a, another different, better way to do it? I'm, I'm open to an increase, just to be clear. I just don't want to um, second guess the uh, staff's judgment about what, what the appropriate solutions would be. Uh, and I would even go so far, uh, if you're amenable, Supervisor Lee, as to saying that in the absence of an increase, we would expect some uh, pr proposal, we would expect some um, explanation or alternative. Fair enough. Okay. Um, Dr. Smith, did you think you understood that negotiated settlement we had on what the motion would include, which I'm prepared to second? Yes, I did. Thank you. And again, it's not, I, I don't want to be misunderstood from my standpoint, it's not that I'm not open to an increase. I fully expect that an increase is likely, I just don't want to tell the staff what their conclusion should be before they go off and do the work. Um, so we have a motion on the floor. Call the roll, please, Madam Clerk. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number nine, and this is a uh, sort of a status report on uh, both uh, the North County and West Valley clinics. And I think um, in the interest of time, uh, Mr. Draper and uh, Mr. Lorenz, what I'd like to do is uh, is this. Um, I'd like to ask where, I think we were looking at quarterly reports on these as, at my request. Am I remembering that right? Here's, here's what I'd like to do. Um, I know you're looking at a feasibility study to come back to us in June. Uh, and um, I want to make sure that happens. So I want to ask that we get a report specifically on the De Anza process that Supervisor Lee and I have weighed in on 
in February and in April, uh, excuse me, yes, February and April, um, so that we know, you know what's, what's happening. I'm going to then ask the folks at Foothill De Anza if they will find a venue in which they can agendize it in March and May so that every month somebody's talking about what progress is or isn't getting made on this effort. Now first, does that work on that piece? If I can get a yes, then I have a, a comment to make. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Then, and forgive me, I'm just trying to march us through this as quickly as possible if I seem a little direct here today. Here, here's my concern. We're not used to doing work on a community college campus with a community college partner. We're just not, we haven't done it before. As far as I know, it hasn't been anywhere in the state of California, much to my sort of surprise once we came up with this proposal. By the same token, the folks at the community college district aren't used to working with county government and they're certainly not used to being in the healthcare business. Um, and it's understandable that both organizations, particularly at the staff level, will have a list of whatabouts that is a mile long and oh gee, we have to, and that's gonna end up pushing the cost of this project up to the point where you're gonna come back and say, oh, that looks too expensive. So what I wanna do is make sure that at every point when somebody says, well, we'd need to replace the parking, somebody says, really, why? I thought there, I thought there was declining enrollment. Do we really need to replace it? We need to replace solar. I'm Mr. Renewable Energy, but really, do we need to replace the solar? And on and on. Oh, we need to have separate utilities. Really, can't somebody just keep the systems intact and send us a pro rata bill? I mean, I, and maybe the answer is no, can't, or yeah, you gotta, or whatever, but I don't want these to be assumptions that get built into the cost. And if when you come to us, um, you know, there's a list of things that are being pushed by folks at the community college district, which I get, that's their role and responsibility. Could we have them called out so that essentially we've got the option to say, here's the basic high end, wonderful quality health clinic, and here's what these other add-ons add up to, so that if the decision makers, meaning the board of supervisors and the community college trustees say, you know what, we could live without this or that, we can do that in a way that holds the cost down, because I'm just worried this thing's gonna turn into a Christmas tree if everybody starts saying, what about this, what about that? Because I know I'm gonna say to you today, you know, I don't think we've talked about whether or not this might be a venue for LGBTQ plus services. I think it can and should be. Supervisor Lee has very specifically, and I think helpfully said, don't forget behavioral health while we're at it. And people have said, oh, okay. And, but I, you know, I, I wanna raise the LGBTQ. But again, I, I'm just worried that two organizations might talk past each other in terms of uh, this effort. And I wanted to just get that right out there and say, um, I'll have the same conversation with folks at the board of trustees. Final thing is, for those who weren't at the November 7th meeting, and that's you know pretty much everybody I think except, except for myself, uh, I, I asked the trustees to put themselves on record saying that they were enthusiastic about this. I said, you know, if you, if you don't wanna do this, or if it's just a pro forma exercise, this is too much work, too much cost, the high stakes are too high, let's not do it. And to a person, all five of them leaned in and looked at their chancellor, looked at their president, looked at their staff and said, no, this is a, this is a big opportunity. Let's not miss this big opportunity. So I think you've got, you know, at the policy level, and now we've got to work it through at the administrative level. And then, you know, that clearing of the throat is the dollar level over to my left, but I think we, I think we can get there. So on um, North County, uh, could we have those reports every other month, the months we're not talking about De Anza? And that way we'll only have to talk about one of those things at each meeting, but we'll also never go more than every other month without them. So if I said February and April, then that would mean March and May uh, back here, okay? Th and thank you, and I look, look forward to seeing those plans develop further. And. Um, Dr. Smith and Ms. Lorenz and everybody else who was part of it, and including Mr. Draper, you know, uh, really a, a joyful day to sort of stand there, at least know we've got a building, we've got a lease, and you know, we've got plans that are underway. So, Supervisor Lee, uh, now that I've hogged all the time, can I get a motion? So move. 
Motion is to uh, take the staff action, uh, recommended action, uh, which is to receive the reports. I will second. We have no speakers on this, Madam Clerk. Confirming that. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Mr. Draper, thank you. Mr. Lorenz, thank you. I promise I'll let you get a word in edgewise next time, okay? <laughs> thank you. That takes us to item number 10, which is diagnostic imaging. And uh, Mr. Lorenz and Mr. Draper, I believe this is you again. And my recollection uh, is, uh, Supervisor Lee, while this is an issue of interest, and I was delighted to see my legislation referenced in the staff report that was probably quite deliberate, but I was delighted <laughs> anyway. Uh, comments or questions from you, sir? Well, first of all, I want to thank the administration for being uh, responsive to our request to have SCIU be an active part of the DI equipment replacement uh, through the DI equipment prioritization steering committee. Uh, a few months ago, when the SCIU members provided our staff a tour highlighting the challenges of our old, outdated, and just broken DI equipment, this was the major source of concern since it was delaying our ability to provide the highest quality of care possible for our patients with many folks waiting for a long time to uh, get the service. And so I would like to, uh, at this point, request the administration to provide updates on these key issues and priorities lifted by the DI Equipment Prioritization Steering Committee onwards during the monthly meetings and how the administration might respond to them in the future. Thank you. And I would be happy to make a motion to receive a report. Happy to second. We have no comments. I don't think we have any public speakers. If not, call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian? Aye. Motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. That takes us to our final, I'll call it omnibus item, which is the item number 11. And uh, Mr. Santiago, in uh, terms of uh, meeting management, I'm going to turn this one a little upside down because I think your verbal report actually uh, blends nicely with uh, the report relating to federal health policy and budget landscape. Correct. And I'm wondering if we could pull Mr. Margolin up, ask him to be patient for a minute. I'm going to run through the other departments and agencies. We have some uh, specific issues I want to get on the record. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with these two gentlemen and uh, the conversation there. Uh, Public Health Officer, Dr. Cody, anything else? Um, mostly I just wanted to note about some... Um, executive leader, new executive leaders in public health, just so that you and the board, um, you both and the board are aware. So you've met Dr. Sarah Redman, who has moved into a role as deputy health officer. Um, basically, we've had a lot of change during the pandemic. In addition, two additions to our health officer team, Dr. Akansha Vaidya and Dr. Krishna um, Sarasi. Uh, Dr. Sarasi is leading the COVID response and Dr. Vaidya, um, the um, uh, uh, harm reduction program and STIs. In addition, Rhonda McClinton Brown is now a new deputy director in public health for strategy policy and planning. And we have a new chief science officer, uh, Dr. Wayne Enonoria, uh, and of course, Marilyn Underwood uh, leading environmental health, which is now part of public health. So those are all new, um, some new people and some new roles, and I just wanted to um, make sure to publicly acknowledge and welcome them. All right, thank you very much. Please convey our thanks and congratulations as well. And Dr. Cody, I'm gonna, uh, in spite of the fact that I'm trying to move myself along, uh, I wanna just pause for a minute and turn to you and say something a little bit personal. You and your team got a lot of accolades for the work you did on the pandemic. What was less publicly noticed was the harassment that you and your team were subjected to during those three years. I want to publicly acknowledge it. I want to say thank you for staying on task and on course uh, through a very difficult time. Obviously, I deeply regret it. I think board members got only a small taste of it. In my case, you know, I had folks just one night uh, after dark with a bullhorn. Uh, I know that that's um, not even a small sample of what a lot of folks in your organization went through. So I just felt like we hadn't had a chance to be together and for anyone to say that and to note it and to acknowledge it and to say it's not what people in public service should have to go through, but it happened and people kept doing their jobs in a way that 
save lives. So thank you for that and uh, regrets for uh, the other. Um, thank you. Thank you. We have a verbal report from uh, the chief executive, excuse me, Supervisor Lee. Um, feel free to lean in, put your button on, and otherwise I'll just keep marching through these items here. Yeah, definitely echo your uh, sentiment of uh, what our uh, huge uh, thanks to our uh, public health department, especially for yourself, uh, Dr. Cody, for what has gone through. As uh, uh, somebody as many mentioned, we, we do all have our own uh, individual uh, 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 issues in, in our house and, and whatnot uh, from time to time, but you know nothing compared to what you've gone through, uh, certainly. And I just want to say thank you for uh, all this uh, trials and tribulations you've gone through in your service to our county in so so many ways and all these difficult times. Uh, and, and, and frankly, I mean, we still have uh, uh, public comments uh, at times for individuals coming up with issues that clearly is against what our signs are showing and then questioning what we do and questioning what you do by name and all that. And we, you certainly know that you have our uh, greatest admiration uh, and support of the hard work that our county has been doing to protect. And frankly, you look at the numbers, uh, the percentages, and, and these uh, great numbers we have in terms of vaccinations, and now that the uh, uh, immunity antibodies that we've been able to develop uh, in all of us in this county, no small things to you. And I always tell my friends when I, 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 uh, I'm bragging about us, is your, your early intervention of the stay-at-home orders, which is weeks before New York City, and that has, you know, somebody actually calculated that the number of deaths that New York City would have saved had they done at the same time we did in terms of stay at home. So those are things that I just want to uh, highlight again of how important your work had been and these very, very tough decisions that you have made that certainly has saved many, many lives. So I just want to say thank you. Um. Our next item is uh, 11C. Verbal report from the CEO at the Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Thank you, Chair Smitty, and I'm happy to take questions on my written report. All right, we'll see if there are any as we get to the sort of end game of the conversation today, and we're getting there. How about from behavioral health? Uh, good afternoon, Chair Smitty and Supervisor Lee Sherry Terrell with Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, you also have our written report, and happy to take any questions. Valley Health Plan. Thank you, Chair Smidian. Um, you have our written report. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, the only uh, thing I would like to say is Cover California does close January 31st for open enrollment. Helpful reminder. Thank you. All right. That takes us to uh, EMS, and I understand that uh, Ms. Lowther is unable to be with us today. So we have with us. I'm Dr. Ken Miller, Medical Director of the EMS Agency, and you have a brief report in your agenda. It is brief because at the February 23rd meeting of HHC, we'll have a conversation about the topics in the report. Um, I'll have with me some colleagues. I'll have the uh, contract manager from our EMS Agency, and I'll have the regional director of the 911 ambulance provider uh, show you, and I'll be here too. So you'll have the right people to have a conversation as thorough and thoughtful. So All with right. that, I'll leave it uh, for your questions. Thank you. Let me just um, help uh, on this item just to share a little information between and among the various parties. Um, first, Dr. Smith, my understanding is that the uh, RFP conversation, which we had thought might come as early as our second meeting in January, is now scheduled for our first meeting in February. Am I up to date and accurate? Yes. So that, that meeting, just for all interested parties, is now anticipated to be, until I see it on the agenda, I'm never sure, and even then I'm not sure, sure, but it's anticipated to be at the first meeting in February. Next thing uh, I would say is um, our meeting on the 23rd of February for this committee may or may not happen on the 23rd. We've got some movement uh, in terms of various other schedules, so uh, as soon as we know, you'll know, uh, sorry to the clerk for that, uh, but we'll uh, we'll figure it out and we'll get back to you, okay? Uh, and um, last thing I'll say, uh, looking at the numbers, is um, I think, as I've said before, we've long since concluded that uh, the on-time performance uh, that we have expressed concern about is um, clearly not just a blip or uh, a peak in a valley. It's a trend that has to be addressed and. Dr. Smith, one of the things I'm gonna to wanna to talk about at the meeting on the 7th is 
whether or not the incentive structure that we are talking about um, is sufficiently significant uh, to ensure timely responses. You may or may not remember that I raised that issue back in 2019 when we did the, um, I think it was the Seventh Amendment. I, uh, this is a much amended agreement. Uh, and um, assurances at the time were uh, that it would be sufficient, yet here we are with the problem. I understand that some will say, well, you can have all the incentives and penalties you want, but if people can't deliver, they can't deliver. So um, that's a conversation that is to be continued both in this committee and at the full board when we have the RFP conversation, okay? Correct. All right, thank you. Uh, custody health. Good afternoon, and excuse my laryngitis. <laughs> my, you have my report, and so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. All right, thank you. And uh, that does take us finally to the verbal report regarding federal health policy and budget landscape. And I did not, my apologies, I did not let uh, Mr. Santiago and Mr. Margolin know that I might ask them to tag team this item. Gentlemen, can you just work that out? I'll, I'll yield my time to Mr. Oh. Bird Margolin. All right, well, uh, I, I'm sure Mr. Margolin will let you lean in, and then notwithstanding uh, my very stern warning about the hard stop at 4.30, uh, Supervisor Lee, are we able to accommodate an extra five or 10 minutes there so that we can give this conversation the 10 or 15 minutes? Absolutely. Needs? All right, Mr. Margolin, I don't want you, I've heard you when you go, go you know, speed explaining, and I can't keep up with you, so uh, let's, uh, what should we know? Let's try it that way. Um, yes, um, I will do my best to be clear, but also brief. So we know that um, dynamics in Washington are something of a mess these days, given the House Republican leadership struggle and the thin governing uh, margin that the House Republicans have. We saw the far right exercise leverage, uh, and they will do that again. Uh, one other point worth noting, though, is that there's a group of more moderate Republicans, they're still very conservative, who on some issues that we'll be talking about um, later in this report may have the ability to exercise leverage as well later on in the process. So the overall dominant issue this year is the debt limit. That's the one driving everything. The Republicans are using um, the issue of raising the debt limit and with all of its catastrophic consequences if it's not done as leverage leverage to get changes in the federal budget, reductions in the federal budget. There are some in Washington who have a, the, a conventional wisdom view that the Democrats will never give an inch on this. It's a, it's a foolish strategy. It's just going to result in this uh, debt limit debacle. Well, there is precedent for the debt limit being used as leverage and a Democrats agreeing to changes because of that, and that was in 2011 when Boehner was Speaker and we had uh, Harry Reid running the Senate and, o and President Obama in place. And the same dynamic occurred. Debt limit was, was put on the table. They came right up to the cusp of crossing the line on the debt limit. Markets already were being roiled and there, was already, there already were negative consequences. And the Democrats agreed to a uh, deal called the Budget Control Act, which created for 10 years the these, these sequestration process where defense and non-defense spending was put, were put under caps. And while those caps were raised um, uh, repeatedly uh, and the, the full level of reduction never occurred, there was some level of restriction in discretionary spending. So it's hard to see the House Republicans having seen Boehner's success in 2011. It's hard to see Speaker McCarthy not taking this to the brink once again. The, the difference this time is that we, we know that, that President Biden doesn't want to go over the edge. We know that uh, Minority Leader uh, that Schumer and, and uh, McConnell in the Senate don't want to go over the edge. And we think that Speaker McCarthy doesn't want to, but he's got this narrow group um, uh, holding the motion to vacate over his head. So there's some risk there. Um, so what's at risk if this, if this actually happens, um, if, if the Republicans get a negotiation on the budget? Um, through this leverage. They, we know they want to protect uh, defense spending and veterans programs 
and, and others uh, that they have historically been the Social Security and Medicare. The program that's not going to be protected by them is Medicaid, the largest remaining program when you protect those, those four. And there is, the risk, uh, there is a risk to Medicaid. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office in December put out a report outlining um, 17 recommendations as to how a, this budget g gap could be uh, made up, how budget reform could occur. And uh, among the 17 were 10 specific reductions in spending. And the number one reduction in spending they put forward was a cap on the Medicaid program. We've seen this Medicaid cap concept before under, under prior administrations. Again, um, uh, it's unlikely the Democrats would ever agree to that, but a Medicaid cap, a per capita cap, um, may be back on the table given the um, debt limit leverage and the CBO recommendation that that be considered. Uh, I shouldn't say recommendation. They say they're not recommending. They're just listing options. Uh, so there are other issues as well uh, in the budget process this year that we have to follow. Um, uh, Dr. Smith and others before uh, Mr. Mr. Santiago talked about the supplemental payments and the dependence of Santa Clara County on those payments. Uh, Dr. Smith specifically referenced the DISH program. Well, the DISH program was significantly cut in 2010 to help finance the Affordable Care Act. You may wonder why the theory was we're going to insure the uninsured. We don't need as much DISH funding. Well, in fact, we did need as much DISH funding, and the Congress, every couple of years, took that cut and deferred it. That cut, once again, uh, the deferral of the cut, once again, expires September 30th of this year. So DISH funding, which is a consequential source of supplemental funding here in California, is going to be on the table. Getting that deferral uh, enacted again in this political environment will, will be quite a, a challenge. Um, there are other... Um, programs as well, um, health care programs that could be a risk in this environment. We have the premium subsidies for the ACA plans that are were, were generously enhanced uh, last year by the Congress and the year before by the Congress. Um, they could be at risk in, a, in this adverse political environment. So uh, there are new health players on the scene in the, to uh, handle all of this. We have Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington State the new chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. She has some uh, background and interest in behavioral health. And while she's a, a key lieutenant for um, Speaker McCarthy, uh, you know, she, she may be prove more moderate on some of these health issues. We don't know yet. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the new chair of the Ways and Means Committee, Congressman Jason Smith from Missouri, has no background in health care at all. He's a former member of the Missouri legislature. On the Senate side, we have an interesting new dynamic in that we have uh, Senator um, Bernie Sanders as the chair of the HELP Committee, and he's identified uh, three priorities in this new role as chair of the HELP Committee, lowering drug prices, expanding health care workforce, and uh, doing something to mitigate the health impact of climate change. Um, and then we, his, his, his ranking member, Senator Cassidy from Louisiana. Senator Cassidy was the author of the Graham Cassidy proposal to repeal the ACA back in 2017, proponent of per capita Medicaid caps in the past. Uh, but Senator Cassidy, despite those positions, has shown some willingness to buck the party orthodoxy and to be a deal maker. And Senator Sanders has said he hopes to work with Senator Cassidy. So that's a very that's an abbreviated version of my report, um, Mr. Chair. Happy to respond to questions or elaborate on issues that you may want me to go into more more deeply. Let me turn to Mr. Santiago and see if you want to thread any of your report. Uh, well, the the big issue here is obviously Medi-Cal, which is as you have uh, duly noted, it's very significant for our county. We're tracking that. Um, obviously, we're very optimistic that the governor in the state of California has included Medi-Cal for all still for January 2024. Uh, we estimate there might be about 20,000 uh, active patients that might qualify for that. So we're doing a lot of work around that. But this is something obviously we're also tracking at the federal level. That additional 20,000 folks, if they were eligible, covered, um, could arrive, could be enrolled in our system and accessing our system with coverage, how soon? Well, it could be as soon as January 2024, as uh, currently programmed. Uh, and again, it has to go through the Medi-Cal managed care plans, as you know, under CalAIM, they're given 
higher profile. And so we need to work very closely with those managed care plans, Family Health Plan and Anthem Blue Cross. And turning to Mr. Margolin again, um, and it's nice to see you, see you, Mr. Margolin. Uh, debt limit is, um, timeline on that is when, what? Um, tomorrow, the debt limit uh, is reached, but the Secretary of the Treasury said that she has the tools to mitigate the impact, moving dollars around using authority she has uh, until June. So the hard deadline, I say hard, it's in quotation marks, is June, even though we technically breach it tomorrow. So it should be an interesting few months. It will be. And if someone were pursuing a Medicare per capita, excuse me, a Medi-Cal, I misspoke, a Medi-Cal per capita cap, um, <clears throat> How would that play out? How does that trickle down uh, in terms of? Uh, well, it, it, it would it would mean that um, California's program would be cut um, a minimum of 10 percent. The amount of Medi-Cal money flowing into California, federal money, would I mean this is depends on the formula. There are lots of details to work out, but based on CBO projections and their analysis, you'd have potentially um, a, a reduction of a minimum of 10 percent, perhaps more than that, depending upon how the formula is structured. And there's just less Medi-Cal money for California. So the state would have to find ways to draw down through waivers, additional supplementals maybe to make up for that, to the extent that supplementals were outside of the cap, which is one of the other issues, uh, how the cap is, to, for the, if the cap um, covers the supplemental funding as well, then we're squeezed on all sides. And it means that the state has to put up more money or counties, as Mr. Santiago indicated, the county currently puts up the bulk of that match. There's more pressure on counties to put up more match for federal dollars because the state will say we can't fund this program um, any more than we already are and the federal contribution has been reduced. Is it possible that one way such a per capita cap might be imposed is by fewer folks being eligible or you know by I mean, changing I mean the, the, it, 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 this, that would probably be a state decision in California's again I, Mr. Santiago might have some thoughts uh, Governor Newsom California the current legislature would probably not want to do that they I mean they might on the edges tinker, but I doubt they'd want to retreat from the progress made in recent years, so probably not an option here in California. It's more a question of finding the funding, and therefore you have a state-county discussion about how we finance a reduced federal contribution. It, it would, Those conversations don't usually work out well for the county, in my observation. Um, well, I, I defer to your humble opinion. I think in this particular case, obviously, the pressure not only the state initially, but also the Medi-Cal managed care plans. Uh, Absolutely. Because, you know, it's one thing to have coverage and benefits, but it's quite another to get access. And so, therefore, the pressure will flow, and obviously the county would subsequently have the pressure as well. Absolutely. That's, Dr. that's Smith, correct. Before I go to you, let me go to Supervisor Lee, because we are going to have to wrap up here in a couple of minutes, and I want to make sure if he's got questions that you can fold any comments in to uh, respond to his questions as well. Yeah, basically, it's the same question of uh, is it going to be reduced reimbursement or delayed payment of these reimbursements to Medi-Cal? How would that 10 percent reduction look like? Thank you. Well, it, it could, again, provider rates are already um, way too low here in California, but there could be an effort by the state initially to squeeze them down further. The big push last year, this year, and future years is going to be to increase the rates. That's what all the providers are trying to get done. So I don't think reducing the rates would go very far in Sacramento to the extent the legislature would have to approve it. Um, I actually, while I wanted to raise the threat of a per capita cap, I do think the Democrats would, I mean, they may give on something. I don't think they're going to give a per capita cap. I think they would make that a, a, red, a line in the sand, a red line. So I don't think it's going to happen, but I just wanted to sort of warn uh, us all that we may enter into that debate once again, and in order to kill that idea, should it surface, have to make all these kinds of arguments once again about what it would do to California. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's the CBO put it out there. Dr. Smith, anything else? 
Well, I just wanted to uh, speak a little bit about CalAIM. You know, the governor has uh, embarked upon a very ambitious model of reworking all of the benefits that are provided for Medi-Cal recipients in California, adding a bunch of, you know, external, um, well, I should say a bunch of benefits that we wouldn't typically think of as medical benefits. Um, so I'm very concerned that in the process, since the governor certainly doesn't want to give up on CalAIM, one model of effectively making the counties responsible for any reduction from the federal level would be to increase the mandate for services without the funding from the state. So they could do that even though they're not supposed to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Supervisor Lee, anything else? In light of time, no questions. Thank you. Mr. Margolin, anything else? Uh, nothing further. In light Mr. of time. Mr. Santiago? Then, without objection, hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. We will meet again at a date to be determined and announced. Thank you all very much. Thanks.